Do you remember the first time you played Sonic Adventure? Seeing this energetic character striking a dynamic pose on the cover? Popping it in and being gripped by its intro cinematic, teasing the conflict, characters, concepts, and of course, the main theme song. Do you remember falling in love with the game's fluid and fast-paced gameplay, colorful characters with their own stories to tell, and the interesting world that was presented? Well, I sure as hell do. Ayo, hey, and here we are once again with Sonic Adventure, a game with many different dimensions and facets of nostalgic memories that a lot of us grew up with. And while 20 years later we can clearly point out its flaws and growing pains as an early 3D title, I can still confidently say that it's an overall great game. Not only one I enjoy revisiting regularly, but also something that is a massive milestone for the Sonic series as a whole. I mean, just think about so many of the things SA1 introduced that are now standard within the Sonic series. All the characters clearly defined and colorful personalities, you were caught with slick character designs, the style of detailed and exciting storytelling, and the adventurous and energetic jams that have become synonymous with Sonic. Sonic Adventure is an important step in the series that not only evolved what had been established in the classic 2D games, but introduced new things we couldn't imagine the series without now. People have been talking and speculating about this potential SA1 remake for years, fantasizing about seeing our beloved childhood gem rebuilt with modern technology and made even better than we found it. I am definitely a big advocate for a full remake of this game, not only because I want to see this game taken even further so that I can love it even more, but also because I think it would be good for the current Sonic team to first-hand work with the entirety of SA1's content so as to understand what made so many of us fall in love with it, and the series at large, in the first place. But aside from that, it's just plain fun to brainstorm and fantasize about a remake of your favorite game. So, with much help from the Sonic community around me, we're going to go into every facet of the game and ways in which it can not only be proper recreated in modern times, but improved and expanded upon. One thing I should make clear is, I am not a game developer, I am not a programmer. What I am, though, is an artist who loves this game. So throughout this video, to convey all ranges of ideas, will be over 200 pieces of concept artwork, literally painting clear pictures of the boundless brainstorming we're going to delve into today, all drawn and colored by yours truly. So if I've sparked your interest so far, you should definitely subscribe, as I've got a lot more content to offer, including my full-on fan-made Pokemon anime, and my giant Halo campaign mod series. Consider too becoming a patron of mine, as little as two bucks a month can go a long way. Of course, if we're talking about recreating Sonic Adventure, let's first clarify what we mean. In my onion, a video game remake is at its best when it's fundamentally the same game, just better in every single way, whether it be through updating gameplay or visuals, expanding on the content, or ironing out the flaws. There are many kinds of ways you can quote-unquote recreate an older game. The simplest way is through a remaster, simply porting the game onto newer hardware with updated resolutions, frame rate, maybe some bug fixes, and other small stuff. Even in Halo Anniversary's case, I still consider that a remaster since it's simply a new graphics engine overlaid on top of the exact same game. Then we have reimaginings, which are full-on overhauls to the gameplay, story, and more that take the basic premise of the original game and put it in a new context or execute it in an entirely different way. Good examples would be the Chronicles games in the Resident Evil series taking the methodical survival horror gameplay of the originals, then turning them into rail shooters with retold, streamlined stories. Then we get to Sweat and Tears remakes, which I think is the sweet spot. Recreating the same game from the ground up, but with improvements all across the board and added content. I think there's actually a big spectrum here. You can have Spyro Reignited, which is the same game with the same mechanics, level design, and so on, but still rebuilt from the ground up with improvements to the controls, new graphics, of course, and updated cutscenes a remake in its purest form. Then you get to the ambitious ones in my favorite breed of remakes. Games like Pokemon Fire Red Leaf Green, Heart Gold Soul Silver, and the Resident Evil 1 remake. Games that maintain the same game that everyone knows and loves while adding a bunch of new content, expansions on the gameplay and story, in addition to upgraded visuals and improvements. Improve, add, and preserve. This is the kind of remake we're going to be diving into with Sonic Adventure. One that not only blows the original game out of the water in every way, but preserves it at the same time. So let's dive into the Azure Blue world and explore what could make for the dream Sonic Adventure remake.
SA1's unique calling card has always been its multiple characters with their own objectives, movesets, and stories. The game is built in such a way where Sonic, who has the most levels, is essentially the main course, while Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Gamma are the side dishes, dressing and seasoning that complement and build onto that entree, as it were. And Big is some wacky fish dessert, I guess. While none of them quite reach their full potential, aside from Big, I find all the non-Sonic gameplay styles fun to varying degrees and worthwhile pieces of the overall game. So, how can this be improved upon? Well, we should ask ourselves, what makes SA1 so fun? In general, we should identify SA1's strengths and further emphasize and build on those aspects. But to get more specific, SA1 in Sonic as a whole is at its best when you're engaging in fast-paced platforming and making fun use of physics to bounce around the level. Most of the other characters more or less already stayed true to this philosophy, so the key would be to lean into that even more. Maintain a sense of cohesion between all the gameplay styles through fast-paced, forward-moving platforming with minimal downtime and not too much time spent in one place, ideally with a handful of shared mechanics between them all, with plenty of ways to speed up your progression depending on your mastery of the character abilities and levels. Since there are so many characters with such diverse pools of moves, they need to be simple and intuitive enough so as to become second nature without the use of heavy tutorializing, but still with enough depth and interesting interactions with the levels. No comprehensive or super complex mechanics, but a solid focus on a core set of abilities for each character that are then used in several differing situations and contexts all throughout the game. Every level should be built featuring areas where you can use power-ups to give you that edge, including the earlier ones as it encourages going back and looking at new ways you can play them once you obtain those power-ups. If you had to ask me what SA1's greatest weakness was, it would have to be that the other character's gameplay could be underutilized, either through being too easy or not having enough content. So the focus should be on improving that, adding a wider breadth of more engaging challenges with harder, longer, or greater number of levels depending on what that character needs, that truly make the most of the abilities each one has. I believe Sonic should still remain as the main course, but flushing out all the other characters' gameplay loops and levels can only be a good thing. When you ask people what their favorite things are about each 3D Sonic game, the answer when it comes to SA1 is usually it's more open and varied level design. So let's lean into that strength, in creating more open levels with more potential variation for each playthrough. Let's look at the beta version of Windy Valley to see just what I mean. This pre-release version of the level is simply incredible, and it's a giant shame it never made it into the game. And so there's a lot of stuff we can learn from it to apply to the new and improved levels for an SA1 remake. For one, just look at how many different interesting paths there are, each with their own twists on the gameplay. This is a level you can truly say you can play a different way each time due to just how much variety there is here. Also take note of how vertical it all is. This is something the 2D Sonic games made frequent use of, where upper paths were harder to get to and stay on but faster, synergizing with their focus on playing to perfection. Also noteworthy is the sheer amount of slopes you can zoom over, allowing for a ton of opportunities to move through the stage in fun ways or reach new heights using the momentum physics system. Again, something the 2D Sonic games are known and loved for. So the takeaway from this version of the level is, not only does this kind of open, vertical level design work really well with SA1, but so does designing the level with sort of a playground mentality. Tons of opportunities to use the character abilities to traverse the map in fun ways. Not every level in SA1 has to go by this exact blueprint, especially as SA1 is known for its varied shakeups to the kinds of gameplay and levels on offer, but I believe this is a great example of Sonic Adventure gameplay and level design at its best and should be used for inspiration. Now, naturally, designing a game for six fleshed-out characters is no easy task, but upon playing Project 06, a fan recreation of Sonic 06 that gives the game the development time it needed but never got, it made me realize just how well reusing assets and stages can work. Parts of 06's stages are reused for every character's campaigns, but the prominent use of character abilities and the expansive multiple routes keep each one's playthrough feeling fresh and unique. So, an SA1 remake could similarly benefit from this type of design greatly. As long as every character shares a consistent movement and physics system, while having their own unique abilities and opportunities to use them, and the level design is multi-layered and branching, you can reuse entire swaths of stages, and still have every character's playthrough of them feel fresh, since that's the type of level design that would feel fresh on repeat playthroughs anyway. This isn't to say they all have to go through their shared stages in the same way, or that they can't have sections unique to them, but in this way, every character benefits greatly from levels built like playgrounds, that each one of them can enjoy and traverse in their own way thanks to flushing out their abilities. It's economic and effective. 
On the topic of initiative-based gameplay and replayability, let's talk about our ranking system. Introduced in Sonic Adventure 2, I firmly believe it, as well as the trick score system, should be backported into SA1. Because it's such an easy way to add an extra layer of primal satisfaction to playing the game and playing it well. Just like in many other Sonic games, you would be rewarded score for killing enemies in quick succession, especially when chaining together attacks. In addition to flashy maneuvers like jumping off ramps, flinging off poles, or clearing a section quickly. Then, you're ranked from E to A based on your performance, factoring in score racked up and time completed. Ranks and score should be applied to boss fights too, like in Heroes. The higher you rank, the more bonus rings you could gain, which could then be used in the Chow Garden so that you're encouraged to finish levels whenever you go out scavenging for animals. The score and rank system is a classic case of positive reinforcement, a simple piece of feedback that can greatly enhance the gameplay loop, although that said, it can work in the other direction as well. If you utterly blow at the game and blunder your performance in a stage, you'll receive negative reinforcement for doing poorly, and for some people, this can have a bad effect on their experience. So, the best and most simple solution here is an option in the menus to disable ranks from appearing at the end of stages. Another way you can add a sense of satisfaction in playing the game is something I think the Boost games are really good at. Through the use of motion blur and other visual effects, you have a good sense of feedback from the raw speed that can make going fast and playing well all the more fun. A Sonic Adventure remake could benefit from this greatly, a simple motion blur effect when rolling down slopes, using the spin dash or hitting dash panels. The Boost games, and Sonic 06 for that matter, also enhance the feedback through having the player crash through stage assets and send parts of enemies flying all over the place. This kind of thing could likewise make tearing through the scenery and chaining together enemy kills all the more fun. Before we get into detail with each character, let's go over a few more aspects of the general gameplay. To the end of encouraging score building toward an end level rank, the live system in SA1 wasn't all that consequential past a certain skill level, so we can give extra lives more meaning through not only increasing the general difficulty of the game, but also giving a good score bonus whenever you obtain one. Meaning racking up extra lives helps you toward a better rank. In SA1, there were two types of shields that would allow you to take one hit without losing your rings the regular shield and the magnet shield, the latter attracting nearby rings. I always found it annoying how your shield would be downgraded from magnet to regular upon hitting a capsule with a regular shield in it. So, how about we add a third, more powerful shield? The Thunder Shield. Whenever you take a hit, it'll limit an explosion on the enemy responsible, not only killing it, but others within close proximity. And to combat the issue of accidentally downgrading your shield, make it so whenever you obtain a shield that is the same or less powerful than the one you already have, it instead upgrades you to the next shield level. So if you have a regular shield and you obtain another, you'll get a magnet shield. If you have the magnet shield and obtain a regular or second magnet shield, you're upgraded to the thunder shield. And just for funsies, how about obtaining any other shield when you have a thunder shield gives you an extra life. With the current day PC version of SA1, the game has seen a lot of love from modders that make a game even more enjoyable. And there are a lot of mods that I'd love to see implemented into the vanilla game of a remake. One such mod is the Idle Chatter, allowing the characters to comment their thoughts on the location or situation through a single button press. Sonic Heroes started the trend of regular in-game dialogue where characters would comment on the story or level at that point. I think this was a good addition that fleshed out the characters, but could become repetitive on repeat playthroughs. So, through in-game dialogue being made available through a button press, it's the best of both worlds. To convey when new dialogue becomes available, you can simply have a button prompt flash quickly on the corner of the screen that you can activate at any time. A common criticism levied toward SA1 is that its camera could be uncooperative. While most of the time the camera is perfectly fine, there are times when it can be finicky and getting stuck on the geometry or when you're trying to point it in a certain direction. I'm particularly fond of how games like Legend of Zelda Wind Waker and Twilight Princess handle their camera. Using an automatic camera as the default, like SA1, but then going into a free camera mode upon command, giving you full control. I think something like this should be implemented into the remake, where using the right thumbstick or the left and right triggers would switch camera modes on the fly. But since SA1 is heavily designed around its automatic camera, you should be able to switch back to automatic immediately with the button press, like with the right bumper for example. Well, with all the preliminaries out of the way, let's prep ourselves for that beloved main course I mentioned, Sonic himself. <laughs> Perhaps the best he's ever played in 3D, Sonic's gameplay featured silky smooth controls, mechanics which gave you a sense of freedom and high maneuverability, and sprawling levels to use those mechanics. Naturally, we'll want to maintain and expand on those strengths, while also re-examining the mechanics to see if we can squeeze any extra fun we can. 
Sonic's gameplay in SA1, I'd say, was a great adaptation of how he played in 2D, while also implementing new things and adjustments tailored to make playing him in 3D just as fun. The momentum physics system was kept intact, but one thing that was missing was the bouncing mechanic. Where in 2D, the higher you bounce on an enemy or item box from, you would go flying even higher than that. I'd like to see this facet of the gameplay re-implemented to further allow for that bouncy and visceral gameplay the 2D Sonic games are known for. You can take it further, too, in awarding the higher score combo for bouncing across enemies than simply homing attacking them, giving streaks of enemies more of a risk versus reward element. To the next gameplay element, the spin dash in SA1 was freaking crazy, allowing you to quickly gain and maintain an immense amount of speed provided you had a good grasp of the controls. While this unchanged version of the spin dash undoubtedly contributed to that feeling of freedom I love so much, I can't help but wonder if its use could be made more meaningful if we imposed some simple limitations on it. In the 2D games, you had to stop and charge it up first, in which you were trading your maneuverability for raw speed, where reckless use of the move would see you losing that speed constantly or running into obstacles. Well, to retain the feeling of fluidity and freedom that SA1 is loved for, I think we should still be able to begin charging without coming to a complete stop, and should be able to maintain full control during the dash. Instead, I think making it more costly to use would be ideal. For example, in SA2, you needed to hold down the button before it began charging, preventing you from spamming it like in SA1. I think something similar to this would be a good solution, except with less time spent holding down the button and more time spent charging to build up speed. Then we can include the simple spin ball move from the 2D games, where in this case, tapping the action button would roll you into a ball that gains more momentum than running when traveling down slopes, better fit for launching you into the air. You know what I'm talking about, the same as how it works with Tails and Knuckles. With this retooling of the move, I think there would be a more meaningful distinction between taking advantage of slopes to gain speed and charging up to blast off. That then brings us to power-ups. In SA1, these things are less of actual power-ups and more so character abilities that are gradually introduced one at a time so as not to overwhelm the player with an overabundance of mechanics and I think that's a good approach. So with that in mind, every level should be built to make use of every power-up like mentioned before. The first of which for Sonic is the Lightspeed Dash. In the original, it was used to gain access to several paths or shortcuts. But because you had to charge it up for a few seconds, it often put the flow of the level to a halt. I really like how Sonic Heroes handled the move, where it's instantly usable upon approaching your path of rings, like SA2, but it also awards you a score depending on how many rings were in the path. With SA1's new scoring system, I'd love to see this implemented here as well. It'd add a ton of fun opportunities to snag some score bonuses by lining yourself up with ring paths, while also giving yourself a speed boost and keeping the gameplay flow intact. And obviously, this move should have its own button so as to avoid accidentally activating other moves. The Y button on an Xbox controller would be a good choice here. However, for the light speed attack, I'm okay with that remaining as necessary to charge up beforehand, as in this instance, you're trading your speed for the time required to charge up and unleash a flurry of blows on groups of enemies. And with this remake's new use of scoring and levels, chaining together quick kills of enemies is even more encouraged so you can use this move to rack up a giant combo score. The patterns of the attack should be made tighter so as to prevent endless looping around targets like in the original, but I also feel there should be an added degree of needing to control and aim the attack to make it more involved, like the homing attack, simply pointing the stick in the direction of the next enemy. In this way, you'd be encouraged to angle yourself against enemies similar to the rings or the light dash. While on the subject of power-ups, a bunch of the upgrades did little more than give you intangible stat boosts to existing moves, like shortening Sonic's charging time or increasing Tails' flying speed. But I think it'd be better if every upgrade like this was reworked to instead open up new options and approaches to levels and bosses, encouraging the player to take initiative. And at that, I'd like for every character to be given at least one new upgrade. So, I think this would be a great opportunity to repurpose Sonic's Crystal Ring. Instead of shortening his charging time for other moves, we can instead reintroduce the Insta-Shield ability from Sonic 3, where tight timing unleashes a flash of light around Sonic that protects you for a split second from damage, and can even deflect projectiles. I imagine this could be put to fun use against enemies and bosses that launch objects at the player. Another new ability you could give Sonic is the Bounce Bracelet. I deliberated for a bit if I really wanted to lift this ability that was unique to SA2 back into SA1, but in the end, I decided it's worth it to include, because it's such a fantastic ability for quickly getting to the ground in midair and maintaining a sense of player-driven flow. And as we'll go into soon, I'm planning to give many of the other characters a similar fast-plummeting move for similar reasons, so having it on Sonic 2 only makes sense. So with these additions and refinements to the physics and abilities of Sonic, levels should be further expanded to facilitate and even require in some instances the skilled use of these mechanics. 
through lots of verticality with opportunities to bounce off enemies and objects, and lots of slopes and long stretches to roll your way up and launch yourself up high. Sonic's levels in SA1 were already great, but I think we can improve upon them even further with these added elements as well as reinforcing the strengths and fun parts of each level. For example, for Emerald Coast, we can break up the iconic whale chase with a short platforming segment, requiring maneuvering through the boardwalks as the whale trails behind you, destroying each foothold, before then resuming back to the second half of the set piece. Speaking of set pieces, the camera should be more involved in following Sonic through them, like in SA2, for the sake of enhancing the spectacle. We could, however, make the set pieces like loops fully controllable, like in the classic games, where it'd be required to build up enough speed to clear them, but I don't mind them remaining as short automated segments, as they do serve a purpose as breathers between the constant high speed action of the general gameplay. Emerald Coast also introduced the jump panels, which would then be used frequently in the stages to quickly transport you around the area. I think they should call for more precise timing to use correctly, meaning you should have to hit the jump button quickly after landing with a shorter window before falling. If you hit the jump button before landing on a panel, you'll fail the challenge and fall down. Maybe you could be rewarded higher scores for the challenge depending on how tight your timing is with each panel. Like I've gone into, the beta version of Windy Valley is absolutely brilliant, so I'd love for the remakes Windy Valley to take inspiration from it. That said, I vastly prefer the more nuanced colors and rustic style of the final game's Windy Valley, as the beta version kinda looks like a Mario 64 level. And I wouldn't mind still having some of those long roadways in the sky that allow you to build up speed. Casinopolis was a very unique stage in the original, being required to gather rings before you could complete the level, either by playing straight-up Sonic or Knights-themed pinball games, or by traversing the sewers. Since the fun diversions from the main gameplay are an essential part of SA1's identity, I'd love to see the stage remain the same, with the pinball games returning. But for those sections of pinball where you enter a special segment, I'd like to see those reworked into short and sweet segments of actual gameplay where you have lots of opportunities to grab rings for yourself. For the Sonic-themed pinball board, it would simply be a pinball-themed platform challenge, akin to Casino Night Zone from Sonic 2, with lots of bouncy gameplay. For the Knights board, the first segment could feature running through a big meadow with a mountainous backdrop taken from the Knights games, with lots of slopes to roll across. The second could feature a nighttime city with a steep platforming challenge. And at the end of both of these segments, you can have a long downward slope focused on hitting and matching the same cards used on the boards, similar to Sonic Heroes Bingo Highway. For the sewer section, I'd like to see it made more spacious to allow for more diverse gameplay potential, where you're encouraged to gather shields so as to maintain your rings, what with the abundance of hazards, and then to ice cap. I'd like to see the first act of the stage longer, with a greater emphasis on speed and openness to complement the second act, which has a greater emphasis on methodical platforming before entering the third act, which is a straight shot downhill snowboarding ride. For the snowboarding, the controls should be refined to be more like SA2's boarding sections, with more emphasis on hitting tricks for score, like jumping through hoops, clearing posts like in Sand Hill, in addition to hitting ramps. The ice stalagmites should be reworked into light obstacles that slow you down when hit, like the cars in SA2's City Escape. For Twinkle Park, we should keep emphasizing the strengths of this level, and having it being very vertical and bouncy, with lots of opportunities to use the momentum physics to get you to new heights. As for Speed Highway, I still believe this is the best level in SA1 due to how it makes good use of each of Sonic's abilities. One thing I love is that you can jump right off the path at the start and run right up one of the buildings on the sides to find extra lives waiting for you, then able to jump all the way back down. I'd love to see more opportunities to run up and across sides of buildings like this. The third act of the level should be made longer so that even at top level play, it takes more than 20 seconds to complete, because vertical playground sections like this are where I think Sonic's gameplay is at its best. Not to mention we should be able to enjoy those sweet, sweet tunes for longer before completing the stage. And just a small detail, but it'd be nice if the cars more resembled the ones seen at the adventure fields, of more realistic sizes for more consistency between the stage and Station Square. Next is Red Mountain, another fantastic stage. This level's first act should expand on the high-low route mentality and verticality, with fun ways to reach higher paths. For the zipline sections, it'd be cool if these were reworked into short, controllable segments. You know how with the flying flower segments in Sonic Heroes you could move up and down throughout them and grab item capsules and avoid minor danger? That mechanic and concept could be implemented into these zipline sections as well, where you're able to quickly ascend and descend by holding up or down. For Skydeck, the focus here should be on staying on the move so as to avoid the incoming enemy volleys and gunfire. The Octane here should be ramped up to go along with the stage's theme of bombastic and frantic action. And I wouldn't mind the second act of Skydeck being given its own music track, as in the original it simply reused Act 1's music. Then, moving on to Lost World, the boulder that chases you shouldn't have rubber banding. That way you're actually encouraged to gain as much speed as you can to outpace it. 
The last big room that you traverse should also be built in such a way to where you can't simply spin dash over to the exit and cheese the whole thing. Now to the last level, Final Egg. I'd like for these platforming segments in Act 2 to be made faster paced with quicker platforms and hazards. And also these downhill curved slopes should be made actual controllable gameplay segments instead of simply set pieces. Again, perhaps Act 3 of Final Egg could be given its own music track instead of reusing Act 1's. Lastly, for the final boss of Sonic's story, the Egg Viper, it could be less reliant on waiting for the boss to make itself vulnerable, but instead have more opportunities for the player to take initiative to attack. Like being able to intercept his laser blasts with a blow of your own, or being able to steal a hit every time the boss rises up and shoots beams. And obviously, the light speed attack should actually work on it, resulting in extra damage if you can time your charge incorrectly. And so there are the ideas I have for Sonic's gameplay, simply reinforcing what I thought were the most fun parts of his gameplay while taking inspiration from the level design of Beta Windy Valley, implementing some more of the 2D game's mechanics and refining his abilities to the end of making a more flowing, fluid, engaging, and addicting gameplay loop. Like I've been saying, Sonic is the backbone of SA1, so it is absolutely essential that you nail his gameplay. In doing so, I think it helps inform how to make the other characters just as fun to play, but with their own unique twists. On that note, Tails' gameplay in Sonic Adventure is an interesting case. His controls and abilities all feel good to use and are just as fluid as Sonic, but the nature of his unchained flight leaves his levels to be extremely susceptible to cheesing, whereas Windy Valley or Sky Deck can be completed in less than 30 seconds each. While I still find Tails inherently fun to control, there is obviously a ton of room for improvement to make the gameplay here much more palatable. And there are quite a few ways we could go about doing that. The first and most simple solution would be to impose more limitations on Tails' flight. In SA1, Tails' energy wouldn't go down so long as you weren't holding down the button to ascend. This is what allowed you to float your way down to the end of Windy Valley. However, in Heroes and Sonic 06, Tails consumed his energy much more consistently and would drop sharply in the air when he tired out. So carrying over this system would go a long way toward preventing breaking Windy Valley and make flying over large gaps more risky. Another route we could take is to keep Tails' unchained mechanics, but change the level design. For example, Windy Valley is so easy to cheese because you're always heading downward. However, this issue immediately cleans itself up upon making the level flow more horizontally. Even more so if you decide to rework the level's flow to be traveling upward instead. Or you could change its stages entirely. Look at how Knuckles and his abilities were adapted into 3D. Instead of having a goal of reaching the end of the stage, he was given wide open playgrounds to search for three objectives. Something like this could likewise work well with Tails' abilities. There are a lot of ways you could tackle Tails' gameplay in a remake, I think the most effective solution would be a combination of these ideas. With all that said, one thing's for sure, Tails' stages should definitely be made longer with more challenging sections. Like mentioned, we could make use of more intermittent objectives throughout each of his levels. Each stage could do with one or two segments in them where you enter into wide open playground like areas where you must complete certain objectives before you can progress. These playground areas should be open and flowing enough to where the stage doesn't feel like it's being brought to a halt and should ideally be all about exploring interesting environments using Tails' abilities. To that end, there can be a bit of randomness involved as to where in the area the objectives can spawn. Not hidden like Knuckles Emerald Shards per se, but just something to encourage looking around and exploring. If we were to go this route, the racing objective wouldn't really work anymore. Anymore. Even in the original game, it really wasn't all that challenging. With this reworked structure of Tails' levels, it would end up as a sort of hybrid between Sonic and Knuckles' levels, and I think this would be an effective way to get the most out of Tails' gameplay mechanics. But in the end, I still think it's important to maintain that fluid sense of freedom Tails' controls have in SA1 as it is, so limitations on his mechanics should be handled with care. Tails' flight should work very similarly to the original game, but to balance it out more, let's give Tails a flight gauge like in Heroes that now depletes even if descending, but will still deplete faster when ascending. Then, when he's out of energy, he will drop sharply in the air so that levels with downward moving flows can't be easily cheesed. The gate should also take two or so seconds to fully recharge after landing, for the sake of encouraging still finding ways to build momentum on the ground first, because I think there should be more of an added element of transferring your momentum on the ground into flight, getting you much more height and distance. Flying should maintain your prior momentum for longer, and levels should be designed to take advantage of this, with certain areas only being accessible through smart use of gaining speed on slopes and ramps. In this instance, Tails' ball roll would be used to more quickly pick up momentum, just like Sonic does. I'd also like to see more use of the tail attack. The window of effect for the base move should be longer, and it'd be really cool to have it be able to deflect enemy projectiles. Encouraging timing and angling it back at them, perhaps even with a score bonus if you redirect an attack. You should definitely be able to perform the move in mid-air, as I think it has some really fun potential. For example, if you're flying and you tail swipe an enemy or item capsule in the air, you should then bounce up into a jump ball. 
in which your flight gauge can be refilled to a certain degree. So you can find fun ways to chain together attacks while in midair, while also keeping your flight gauge filled without having to land. There should also be a greater diversity of challenges when in flight itself. You can take the dash rings in the original that boosted you forward while resetting your flight timer, and create more challenging segments all about hitting them to preserve your flight to clear a super large gap. You can have more segments about avoiding obstacles or hazards during flight too. The next one is a detail I'd like to see return from the 2D games, and that is to give Tails a little doggy paddle animation whenever flying underwater. As such, we could see a few more underwater segments in his levels, as I also think one of his power-ups could be given a super fun interaction with water. The Rhythm Brooch upgraded Tails' tail attack into a continuous spin, and you could spin faster and more effectively strike foes if you spun the control stick in the direction Tails was spinning. And so this little quirk of the original inspired this idea I have of reworking it. What if this move worked like the spin attack in the 3D Zelda games, spinning the control stick for a short period where the attack is activated, where in SA1's case you would go spinning around like Taz the Tasmanian Devil, where you control the direction and maintain the attack for 2 or 3 seconds, or until jumped out of. Enemies hit by this could be flung away, pinballing into other enemies and exploding, but in particular the idea I had was, when the move is used underwater it creates a whirlpool that not only sucks in underwater enemies, but sends tails flying upwards super fast, flinging yourself up out of the water and giving you an opportunity to chain into flight and preserve that upward momentum. You could also use this move to create secret level paths only accessible by using this technique. And on the topic of power-ups, the jet anklet in the original increased the speed at which you flew. Ironically, I think Tails' levels play better without this power-up as it's harder to cheese him with a default flying speed. I think the jet anklet should be reworked into something more interesting that doesn't break the game. Perhaps instead allowing you to perform an air dash, a short burst that quickly shoots you through the air, extending your flight distance by a bit, and like with the tail attack, if you aim it right and hit an enemy in midair, they'll bounce up and have your flight gauge refilled by a bit. In this way, you could use it as a pseudo-homing attack provided you have the skill to use it right. I'm quite fond of the idea of giving every character one extra power-up not seen in the original. So, for Tails, you could give him a ring bomb attack he's had since Heroes. It'd be aimed by holding down a button and locking onto the strongest and nearest target, where Tails would then quickly throw the ring bomb and destroy any foes within the radius. This power-up could perhaps be found on the second floor of his workshop, previously inaccessible in the original game. Now that we have a clear vision as to how Tails should play and how his level should be structured, let's talk about his individual stages. Like said, making Windy Valley more horizontally or even upwardly oriented would go a long way toward increasing the longevity of the stage. But like mentioned, each stage would be broken up by one or two exploration segments. So in Windy Valley's case, one such segment could be a wide open area with multiple platforms of varying heights, kind of like one of Mario 64's wing cap stages with numerous ways to get around each platform, some using springs, some using dash rings, or some using momentum physics. The objective being to find and tail swipe three wind turbines in order to activate a path of wind that will then whisk you to the next section of the level and send you flying out at great speeds for you to then take advantage of through chaining into flight. For his Casinopolis, it should be made way more spacious. The best part of Tails' gameplay is the freedom of his controls, so his level should be built to accommodate that. Here, you could introduce the concepts of underwater segments, as it does take place in the sewers, simple sections of using Tails' doggy paddling to reach the next area, or you could even go the Aquatic Ruins route of having the level be about staying on the high routes and avoiding falling into the slower underwater routes. And lastly, the fans here should be reworked to be less of set pieces, but instead give off short but powerful gusts of wind that send you flying into the air, where it'll then be up to you to use that momentum and reach higher platforms. For Tails' ice cap, this is an easy one. Make it an actual level for Tails, and don't just recycle Sonic's snowboarding. And in particular, I think giving him Act 1 of ice cap would make more sense than giving him Act 3. Remember how I mentioned Sonic's Act 1 of Ice Cap would be more open? Well, I think this could be made to work very effectively for Tails' version of the level. This level could also feature a couple underwater areas like in Sonic 3, and for its exploration segments, maybe it could be about ringing three loud bells in order to trigger an avalanche which opens up the path to the next area. Next, for Sand Hill, we could keep the snowboarding as a short section, similar to SA2's City Escape, but I would love to see this stage likewise transformed into an actual level for Tails. For this level, you could have a focus of staying off certain stretches of sand, as you'll slowly sink into them. So you either have to time your flights and its recharge carefully, or travel between safe stone footholds. Perhaps the invincibility power-up could even make you immune from sinking while active, allowing you to safely run across. I also think Tails' Rhythm Brooch should be introduced earlier. I think just before Sand Hill would be a good place, where after you obtain it, you must clear out a big pile of sand to reveal the switch to open up the entrance to the level. This sand clearing gimmick could then be used in the level itself, to find hidden power-ups or even the objectives. 
Set objectives can involve using the rhythm brooch to dig up totems buried in the ground, where they would rise up and open up the path to continue. And since the power-up would have been introduced before this level, there should also be an underground spring segment where you have the chance to use the rhythm brooch's ability to create whirlpools and launch yourself back to the surface. Tails of Skydeck could feature strong gusts of wind that would blow you away if you're in the air, so you'd have to time your flights carefully when outdoors. Just like Sand Hill, maybe grabbing an invincibility power-up could make you immune from being blown around. On the flip side, perhaps we could also have sections where you use the wind's strong gusts to your advantage to reach far-off areas and platforms. You could also have indoor hangar sections where Eggman's Jetmax launch from. You could then find switches to close the shutters so that you can seal the strong winds from outside so that the area is easier to traverse. The objective section could use the last area from the original level, with several walkways surrounding a large central cannon. You could find three small cannons and prime them all, in which they will then fire at the larger one, destroying it and completing the level. Then to Tails' last level, Speed Highway. Since in the story you're literally racing Eggman to save the city, maybe this level could have a time limit like how several of SA2's levels do, along with seeing Eggman flying through the level like in the original. Speed Highway was already the best Tails level in the original, so we should reinforce its strengths. In this case, a huge amount of multiple paths that encourage building up momentum, with long stretches with few platforms, in which you must either hit dash rings or chain off enemies to stay in the air. Connecting these segments, you could have short objective segments where Eggman sends in several robots to slow you down or you must destroy them to move on. This should be kept brief and not overused so as to maintain the flow of the level. In the areas your stop should remain large and vertical, more so focused on traveling to the robots that come to stop you, rather than taking on a huge pack of them in one small arena. Lastly, the Egg Walker. This boss fight should be adjusted to add more difficulty and require more use of Tails' abilities. You could still have the sections of Eggman stomping the ground, but for added challenge, Eggman could send large shockwaves across the ground, where you then must fly above to evade. Maybe further on in the fight, he can mix this attack up with shooting bombs at you at the same time, so that you have to tail swipe to deflect them while also staying off the ground to avoid the shockwaves. These bombs should be able to be flung right back at Eggman to damage him. Eggman could release a bunch of tiny mosquito robots that surround you in flash, preparing to emit a powerful shock. When this happens, you must use the Rhythm Brush's tornado attack to send them flying away. And for an added element of skill, each of these tiny robots will explode into sparks upon being flung away. So you can also use this to deal further chip damage to the boss. And finally, Eggman could shoot several rings of electricity one after the other that you must fly through in order to avoid being shocked. Similar to how the Bio Lizard's Dark Energy Sphere attack works in SA2. And so those are my ideas on how to improve Tails, trying to balance adding more depth and complexity while maintaining his fluid and free-feeling controls, and making his levels longer, more engaging, and palatable to his moveset. Knuckles, on the other hand, is going to be much more simple to improve upon, since his gameplay worked really well in SA1 and is second best to Sonic. Searching for three pieces of the Master Emerald using a hot and cold system and large and vertical playground-like levels. The flow of the hunting stages in both this game and SA2 is all about skillfully and quickly sweeping the environment until you get a blip on the radar. That element of traversal of a wide open area is the fun of these stages in My Onion, so it should be expanded upon with more things like slopes and bouncy interactions that Sonic and Tails have, for example. The worst you could say about Knuckles' stages here were that they were too easy, which could be attributed to different things depending on how you look at it. One could be the overly generous radar system, capable of detecting all three shards at a time, not even conceptually but literally sometimes, or you could attribute it to the levels simply being too small. Sonic Adventure 2 tackled both of these issues by nerfing the radar and expanding on the maps, and I'd say the stages were better off for it. However, having played SA2's hunting stages with a mod loader option which makes the radar behave like an SA1, I can confidently say that the radar in SA1 was not the issue, as the SA2 stages with this option enabled still work great, or even better. Rather, SA1's hunting stages are indeed too small, so we should seek to expand on their sizes, whether horizontally or vertically. Knuckles' moveset is perfectly tailored to allow for long stretches of both orientations, so as long as you don't go overboard like Matt's base, this can only be an improvement. This could also improve a lot on Sonic's gameplay when he visits the same locations, allowing for longer play times and more potential gameplay depth in reaching higher routes using that added verticality. While we're talking about difficulty, the hint system in SA1 needs to go. Simply activating Tikal, showing you exactly where the emerald piece is, is very dull. 
whereas in SA2, hint monitors would give you vague hints about the pieces, becoming more specific with each hint given per piece, also lowering the score you'd receive when you eventually found it. I'd like to see a similar hint system in place here, only maybe less cryptic on the first hint. And still using to call, as I'd like the idea of her personally helping Knuckles to find the lost Master Emerald shards. And speaking of scoring, it should work the same as in SA2. The faster you find a shard, the higher the score awarded for it will be while using a single hint will lower that score by one level. To add more things to do while searching and to complement Knuckles' character, I think there should be added emphasis on killing enemies while hunting, where there could be clusters of them, encouraging destroying them in quick succession in order to build up a combo score. And to maintain a sense of speed while attacking, Knuckles' punch should give you a burst in momentum like how it does in SA2. The rank system of these stages should also be designed in a way that killing enemies is of similar importance as finding the Emerald Shards fast. Since one of the things I found the hunting stages lacking in the original was how there wasn't reason to do anything other than find the shards, I think this added bit of complexity and motivation thanks to the ranking system will help flesh out the stages a lot. Now let's move on to Knuckles' other moves obtained through power-ups. The Shovel Claw worked by pressing the jump and action button together on the ground where you could dig out items, rings, or the emerald shards. I think SA2 made this move way more interesting and fun, using the drill dive to then burrow into the ground. I think the Shovel Claw in SA1 remake should work the same way and allow you to perform the same drill dive, allowing for fun spiraling from high up in the stages too to reach the ground below. Likewise in SA2 you should also be able to dig into the sides of walls where you could then hide more emerald shards there. You could then design certain types of enemies that are only killable by the drill dive, like turtle mechs that spin and emit spikes blocking your punches. I think Knuckles' gameplay, like Tails's, could do with a bit of water interaction too, but instead of going underwater, simply allow him to always stay afloat atop the surface. Maybe you can still punch and it could even thrust you forward in the water. The reason I want to add water pools here and there is because I think his power-ups could benefit from it with fun interactions. So, since Knuckles doesn't have any underwater swimming like SA2, you can instead make it so the drill dive plunges you down, and with the higher you jump from, the deeper you go. You can design fun interactions here such as placing item capsules, enemies, springs, or even the emerald shards deep in pools of water, encouraging mastering the drill dive by traveling to high places. To add to this, we can also introduce a new power-up called the Thruster Cuffs. To expand on Knuckles' default punch attack, we can introduce an extension to that called the Drill Thrust. It will be activated by punching twice and then holding down the action button, which will then propel you forward into a fast drilling attack, with all enemies killed by this move feeding into a combo score. Then you could design hidden areas and levels only accessible by destroying obstacles blocking the entrance. And like the drill dive, this move could have fun use while swimming, allowing you to torpedo yourself quickly through the water, destroying anything in your path. Thanks to this power-up, pools of water could potentially lead to faster traversal of areas than simply running. And lastly for Knuckles' power-ups, the fighting gloves. I'd like to see the same thing done to the maximum heat Knuckles attack as with Sonic's light speed attack, requiring more of an emphasis on using the control stick to aim the attack toward the next enemy. Let's move on to specific parts of Knuckles' campaign. For the Chaos 2 fight, I'd like to see an emphasis and conveyance of Knuckles' punches being capable of deflecting Chaos's claw swipes. Because where Sonic and Tails' Chaos fights make use of heavy evasion, Knuckles, on the other hand, could take him head on. And as such, whenever Chaos extends his arm to swipe at you, punching should redirect it right back at him to damage. As for Knuckles' stages, like mentioned, their sizes should be expanded so that it's no longer possible to pick up all three shards at the same time. And to add to that, their placements should be designed to where they always spawn as far away from each other as possible, to encourage exploration and good use of many parts of the levels. One thing I'd love to see is for Knuckles to be given the new and improved Sand Hill, like Tails. He could visit it right before Lost World, and to access it, you could use the Drill Thrust to clear out a pile of sand to reveal the switch, similar to how Tails enters the stage. That gimmick could then be used in the stage to hide shards or items like before. Knuckles' Sand Hill could take inspiration from SA2's Wild Canyon, the top being a sandy plain filled with ruins and maybe a small spring somewhere, the bottom being an underground interior, accessible via drill diving into sand pools. Maybe the underground could even be sectioned off by bars, where you're able to see the other areas that aren't accessible. So you have to find the corresponding sand pits on the surface to access them. Maybe some of the enemies in this stage could hide underground where Knuckles must dig them up first in order to destroy them. So you could choose to dig them all up first and then bust them for the maximum combo score. Once Knuckles boards the egg carrier, I'd like to see a short puzzle about draining the water from the egg carrier's pool in order to access the level, ideally using these platforms surrounding it. This area is just sort of asking for that kind of puzzle. The only other thing I have to mention regarding Knuckles' stages would be that in his sky deck, the lever to control the orientation of the ship maybe should be moved to the middle of the area, rather than way in the back. Because depending on how you've set it, it can be hard to get back up to it in order to change the direction. 
Knuckles in SA1 was already a great start, so just by adding some additions to his moveset, expanding on the sizes of his levels, and laying out some simple motivation through scoring in a ranking system, they can be made much better. Amy's gameplay is in a similar position. A good start that makes fun use of floaty controls and platforming, but is held back by two issues. One, her running movement has too slow of acceleration and top speed, and two, a severe lack of levels, only having three. There's a lot of interesting things we can do with her gameplay, so let's jump in. In SA2's multiplayer that let you play as Amy, I feel her controls there were just right. Not as fast as the other characters, but still feeling smooth and capable of picking up speed. I definitely don't think Amy should be made to be a Sonic clone like Heroes, as she's meant to be the down-to-earth regular among Sonic's friends. So instead, we'll focus on the most fun aspect of her style in SA1, which is her floaty platforming, making use of her hammer to perform acrobatic maneuvers. Her acceleration should remain such that it allows her gameplay to focus on picking up speed in order to chain into acrobatics. So to complement this, we can add the same pole swinging mechanic seen in games like SA2, only here based on actual physics where you'd need to latch onto the pole at a good speed and time your jump to get the most distance and height. Her regular hammer strike shouldn't completely stop your momentum, it should work like Tails' tail attack so as to maintain a sense of flow. Perhaps instead of Amy's hammer insta-killing enemies, we can instead send them flying and crashing into walls and other enemies where they'll then be destroyed, allowing for fun and chaotic pinballing of them against each other. You could then get creative and strike hazardous stage assets like spiked balls against the enemies, or obstacles blocking the path to progress. Like mentioned with how the classic 2D bouncing physics should work on enemies, the same should apply to Amy when whacking enemies in midair with her hammer, only even more. Hitting an enemy like this should boost you into the air, allowing you to bounce across several enemies in a chain. There are already cool tricks you could pull off in the original level, so let's expand upon this, and have sections in our levels where mastery of her acrobatics is key to reaching higher areas or even required as the difficulty ramps up. Constant bounciness should be a key aspect in these levels, encouraging you to stay in the air by bouncing off of objects, stage assets, and enemies. And maybe the longer you can keep this going, the higher you'll be rewarded a combo score. We could take this further in even giving Birdie more involvement in the gameplay. What if the higher the combo score, the better the items of a wide variety Birdie would give the player? So for example, getting 300 points would reward you with a 10 ring capsule, 1000 points would give you a shield, and 2000 points would give you invincibility. And of course, we can't forget about Zero, the stalker chasing you through these levels. His AI and aggression should definitely be ramped up, as past a certain skill level, he became a complete joke. So what if we made it to where the longer the player goes without attacking him, the more aggressive he gets. But like the original, attacking Zero too much would result in him going into an enraged and vulnerable state. So dealing with them becomes a balancing act. And just like you can whack enemies to send them flying, it would also be funny if you could deflect Zero's fist launch attack back at him, in which you'll be dazed for several seconds. Additionally, what if we could also find ways to temporarily shut Zero down, or even eject him from the area for the time being? Using the environment against him, like stunning him, then running to a switch and activating a shield barrier that locks him out of the area. Stuff like this that rewards player ingenuity and observation. This would be a really cool element to add to the more puzzle-like segments, like Hot Shelter, where you need to place keys into the holes to progress. Amy's Warrior Feather in the original was pretty useless, locking you into place as you spun around and made you dizzy afterwards. Going along with the theme of shared familiar abilities, let's make it function similarly to Gamma's Jet Booster, in that it'll slow your descent midair, but also be capable of whacking any airborne foes. This ability would synergize really nicely with Amy's greater focus on acrobatics and staying in the air to string together enemy kills. For her long hammer in OG, it simply extended the range of Amy's standard attack. Let's give it a much more unique function. Amy's long hammer can instead allow her to perform the same ham crazy spinning attack as Tails' rhythm brooch, sowing chaos in tight spaces packed with lots of enemies. As for a new upgrade, how about we give her a little gadget called the Gravity Ring, allowing her to quickly dive to the ground like Knuckles Drill Dive, strike the ground with a hammer and immediately bounce right back up. This could be used to kill enemies in one hit, but also on special stage assets like big trampolines that will fling you super high into the air, or maybe even used to destroy obstacles in order to access alternate paths. With that, let's tackle Amy's levels. For her Twinkle Park, like Sonic, you can have her interact with more optional carnival attractions for extra rings and items. An obvious one for that being the High Striker game, where the higher you drop to strike with the hammer from, the higher it'll go, rewarding you better items. You could also take advantage of the carousel section in the level and lock you inside of it together with Zero, the objective here being not only to evade him, but destroy the Eggman robots pretending to be horse rides in order to open the exit. 
one thing is clear with Amy, and that's that she needs at least two more levels. The first of which could be Windy Valley. Given Amy's focus on floaty acrobatics, Windy Valley with its trampolines and upward gusts of wind is a natural fit. Perhaps it could take place at night, where the air and wind could be perfectly stable, creating contrast with the day versions which have a lot of noise and activity from the gusts everywhere. So, to traverse the level and create new paths, you could find switches to activate fans that will carry you across gaps. Amy's levels in the original featured soft stealth mechanics of hiding in barrels to avoid Zero's detection, and I think this can be massively improved upon. So, starting in Windy Valley, how about we introduce a new type of Eggman robot called the Seeker. Casting a visible beam of light where if you enter its path, it will call upon reinforcements, in which Zero and other Eggman robots will then drop in and follow you for the rest of the section. But if you can destroy this robot prior to that, you'll be awarded a big chunk of score and avoid Zero chasing you for the entirety of the level. You could take this idea further too, as perhaps in Amy's Hot Shelter, there's a new section where you must avoid lasers. If you touch them, Zero and the other mechs will swoop down on you like before, but you could also find the device controlling the lasers in which disabling it can also gain you points. All of Amy's stages in OG had these segments that broke up the linear progression of the stages. Puzzle-like segments, basically. I think these kind of quote-unquote puzzles should be less about thinking and more about exploring. So for example, in that key puzzle of OG, one of the boxes was located farther away, forcing you to search for it. I think this should be done for all the key boxes here, and the environment should be made into a large and open playground, like in Tails' objective sections we gone over. Also, remember when I mentioned using the environment against Zero in fun ways? Well, what if near the end of Hot Shelter, you could whack Zero into a lifeboat and then hit a button to send him flying out of the egg carrier? I think that would be hilarious to do, and could even give you a score bonus. Another level you could give Amy is Sand Hill. A fun gimmick for this level would be, like how with Tails you had to navigate around footholds and stay off the quicksand that would slowly drag you in, Amy could have to do the same, where you'd only be able to perform her hammer jumps on solid ground and not the soft sand. Amy's Sand Hill should feature that high low route mentality the 2D games are known for, where the higher paths you won't have to deal with the quicksand. And like Windy Valley, you could avoid Zero for the entirety of this level as long as you don't run into any Seeker mechs. Which then brings us to Amy's last level, Final Egg. This level should feature both the Seeker mech and laser dodging, as there will be more traps for Zero to find you here. However, likewise, you should be able to trap him like before. One such trap I can imagine is luring him over to a hatch in the garbage disposal, stunning him, then hitting a switch to dump him down with the rest of Eggman's scrap. The puzzle at the end of the level should be repurposed into a set of large spaces about finding switches to open up the doors to proceed, with a light maze-like layout without being too restrictive or confusing. To maintain that element of RNG from the original game segment, the switches, and hell even the order of the large rooms themselves, can be randomized on each playthrough. And last, the final showdown with Zero. He had a really tiny health bar in the original game, so that should definitely be extended to give this fight more longevity. As this is the final boss of Amy's story, Zero here shouldn't pull any punches, and the emphasis should be on chaining acrobatics in order to evade his ground-based attacks, like his shockwaves or spinning electric wire move. Unlike in the original, Zero will deflect you if you try to strike him from the front, so you must get behind him in order to whack him into the surrounding electrified barrier, in which his weak point will be revealed. You should be able to deal multiple strikes when this happens, in which you'll close his lid back up after a few seconds. So, this can give you an opportunity to bounce up high and strike down from that height, in which you should do more damage. To that end, you can place a pole in the middle of the arena, allowing you to bounce up, latch onto it, and gain even greater height for even more damage. And so once again, I tried my best to take what was the most enjoyable part of the character, and expand it to make a more engaging and content-rich experience. Hopefully this can allow Amy to still feel cohesive with the other characters' mechanics and physics, while also using those elements in a different way, making her unique. Which then brings us to E102 Gamma. His gameplay used sort of a risk versus reward loop, locking onto as many enemies as you could within the limited time the targeting laser was active, to unload for the maximum combo score, in which you were rewarded extra time, feeding into the limited amount of time you had to complete the stage. I think the time limit on his stages are a neat idea, giving you a sense of urgency. However, in the original game, the only stage where this was really relevant past a certain skill level was Hot Shelter, so the time limit should be rebalanced so that it's more meaningful to the earlier stages as well. However, I wouldn't be miffed if the limited time was removed entirely. As with the other characters, and especially in the case of Gamma, we should focus heavily on combo scoring, feeding into your end rank, where just like in SA2, the more enemies you lock onto at a time, the higher score you'll receive. Similar to before, the main flaw of Gamma's gameplay and how it's not utilized to its full potential. 
in this case having levels that are too short. So naturally, the length of levels should be extended, but like with the rest of the game, with fun ways to speed up your flow through the use of physics and player ingenuity. As such, to facilitate the use of physics, I think it would be a good idea to give Gamma the same acceleration at top speed as Tails and Knuckles. Then, just like how the other characters have different running animations to convey reaching higher levels of speed, Gamma's transport mode animation from the original should now serve this purpose. Hot Shelter was the best level Gamma had, and it's no coincidence that it also happened to feature the most use of slopes and speed, something the other levels could also stand to benefit from greatly. So, in addition to comboing enemies, this added focus of momentum platforming can improve his broader gameplay loop and help him feel more at home with the other styles. And with greater emphasis to fast-paced movement, you could make enemies more aggressive in their attacks to add more meaning to the risk versus reward factor of comboing them. In that when hit, you're knocked out of your combo that you're currently building up. So you'd need to find a balance of evading their attacks and knowing when to release your combo. So we have that base of simple and effective gameplay, let's see how we can build onto it through the use of Gamma's power-ups. The first of which is the Jet Booster. Use to slowly descend and get you more distance across gaps. I think this was greatly improved mechanically in SA2, where it would preserve your upward and forward momentum more before slowing down, allowing for depth and thought in its use. That same polish to the move should be applied in an SA1 remake. Additionally, you could also rework things to make the power-up instead use Gamma's propellers. Since it's kind of weird how he already has that, but needs a supplementary gadget and the jet booster to actually hover. Regardless, I think the hover power-up should be introduced earlier, just before Emerald Coast. Where before Gamma leaves the egg carrier in search of Froggy, he arms up with a power-up from the armory. And if you do replace the jet booster with the propellers, you can instead have an added focus of having Gamma avoid touching water altogether, lest he be shocked, rather than automatically hovering over it like the original. After that, where the hover power-up used to be, just before the Sonic character battle, you could introduce a new power-up, the Quick Shield. The same basic idea as Sonic's Insta Shield, only lasting a tad longer, and only effective from the front, blocking all damage and deflecting enemy projectiles while active. To make good use of this power-up, you could introduce enemies which fire homing rockets at the player in which you're encouraged to return to sender and blow them up and all other enemies around them, in which you could receive a higher score bonus than if you simply locked onto them, encouraging looking for opportunities to switch up your tactics for higher rewards. And for Gamma's optional power-up, the Laser Blaster, I'd like to see this reworked into something with a more unique function. Rather than simply giving your main attack splash damage, you could instead turn it into a bomb thrower where you would hold down a button in which it will automatically lock onto the nearest and highest priority target, firing when released. Just like Tails' ring bomb, look at that! You could introduce another new type of enemy that is large and powerful, and would normally require multiple lock-ons with your main gun to destroy, but with the use of the bomb thrower, can be taken out in one hit. Lastly, I thought of another new power-up to further complement the new focus on momentum, you could introduce a grapple hook power-up called the Grapple Claw, extending Gamma's left hand and latching onto the same poles that Amy uses. This could be used to great effect on stages to reach alternate paths, but also fling yourself into the air and chain into the hover, giving yourself height advantage over enemies. Maybe this upgrade could be found from a certain egg carrier lifeboat that crash landed somewhere in the Mystic Ruins. Now, let's go into the ways which Gamma's levels can be improved to use these new abilities. Gamma's first level, Final Egg, should still serve to introduce his gameplay rules, but should be made longer with more varied challenge sections, so that it serves as an actual level worth replaying. And in addition to tutorializing the combo shooting, it should also convey that you can use momentum with Gamma the same way you can with the other characters. Also, you know how you can reach a secret area at the end of the stage? What if in that secret area you could find a hidden supersonic doll? Not just in this stage either, but what if every stage had this doll as a hidden bonus collectible, in which they'd be hidden in out-of-the-way paths, only accessible with certain upgrades, where destroying one would net you 2,000 points. Just a funny little idea, kinda like the gold gun beetles in SA2. With Gamma's Emerald Coast, if you go the route of replacing the jet booster with propellers, you could then introduce segments all about avoiding touching the water, lest you receive an electric shock. It would also be nice if Gamma was given one more level. Since Lost World is the only level to see two characters enter it, how about we give him that stage? You could have him use the same dark, water-filled cavern that Sonic goes through, only where Sonic has to use mirrors to light the way. You could take inspiration from SA2's Lost Colony, and have Gamma's destroying of enemies temporarily light up the room. Since this section also features water, you could have an element of high-low routes, where the higher the path you manage to get to, the less you have to worry about evading water pits. For Gamma's Windy Valley, you can make more use of gusts of wind as a mechanic to guide your hovers, to reach across gaps into new paths. Maybe there can be segments using large open areas, where your path is blocked by some rubble. So you have to find a small missile launcher somewhere around the area to activate and blow it up. This concept could be used in the Delta boss fight later, so it would be good to convey its use in the level beforehand. 
Red Mountain could feature a couple sections all about building momentum to escape lava pouring in behind you, navigating twists and turns while also locking onto enemy enemies along the way, and swinging off poles. You could also feature rock platforms that are pushed high up into the air by lava geysers, where when standing on top it flings you into the air, which you can hover to maintain that momentum and reach new areas. Hot Shelter was already a great level with a memorable set piece in the train ride, so most of what this stage needs is to keep emphasizing the slope-filled corridors that use momentum, and those large vertical spaces all about managing hovers. Next, I want to address a weird little thing that never made sense. Gamma fights Eggman robots in Emerald Coast despite them still being on the same side by that point. Final Egg did it right in giving us Sonic Tails and Knuckles dolls to destroy, so I feel like we should similarly substitute the Eggman mix here. Maybe Eggman can send in dummy targets for the player to destroy instead. Still capable of attacking so as to still provide a challenge to face. That also then brings up Gamma's new level in Lost World. What would he fight there? Well, since he'd be an unwelcome presence, what if he fought off the spirits of the deceased Echidna warriors guarding the place? Ghosts aren't anything new to the Sonic series anyway. Hell, if we were to go this route, you could then add him here and there in the other characters' versions. But not for Knuckles, for obvious reasons. Next, let's talk about Gamma's boss fights, most of which were laughable. Able to stun lock the opponent over and over and defeat them in less than 10 seconds. These are ripe for improving both in difficulty and interesting gameplay. Each fight should be less about key opportunities to deal damage and more about building up a series of chips to their health in between the opponent's offense and defense. Since the first beta boss comes right after the first level, it should remain relatively low in difficulty, but still present a challenge to keep the player quick on their feet. A good start here would simply to have beta capable of everything the player is at this point, locking on, shooting, running, and jumping. As such, Beta's gameplay loop involves him quickly jumping away and evading your shots, slowing down to target you and fire you in intervals. You can intercept his shots with your own, meaning you can use your own attack defensively, but you also have to seek opportunities to land hits on Beta. In general, the E-Series fights shouldn't let the player just spam shots, but it should also be more involved than simply waiting around for the bosses to make themselves vulnerable. I think this simple start to the bosses would help build the base for the other E-Series bosses to build onto. With that, let's move on to Delta. Since this fight takes place in Windy Valley, I think Delta should make use of blowing gusts of air at the player, in which he will attempt to blow you off the platform, so you must stay out of the path of the attack. But if you are blown off, you can try to use the hover to get yourself back. He could also have an attack in which he points his weapon upward and uses it to form a tornado that sucks you in, where you must get as far away as you can while the attack is active. There could be several platforms outside of the main arena that you could jump to and even use to land if you're blown away, in which on a couple of them you could find the same missile launchers you saw on the level, and fire them at the main arena to deal some free damage to Delta, but at the risk of being blown off the smaller platforms. And maybe if you've obtained the grappling hook, you could latch onto a couple poles located on side platforms in order to endure his gusts of wind. And now to the Epsilon boss fight. Since it takes place in the lava-filled caves of Red Mountain, he could make use of a flamethrower that has a long reach and slowly pans in one direction. Kind of like the big-ass laser attacks of the mech character battles in SA2. Epsilon would make heavy use of homing missiles in which you're encouraged to use the quick shield to deflect them back at him. He could also stomp on the foothold in which lava is splashed onto the arena, creating damaging puddles you must avoid. So the focus on this boss is dealing as much damage as you can while avoiding his burst of fire, the lava on the ground, and intelligently timing your deflections of his homing missiles. Then we come to Zeta. This boss should still be all about targeting all the mounted cannons, while the arena keeps you moving around in a circular motion, with a more complex arena that gives you more options when it comes to your approach. So to go with that, how about we give her another method of attack in periodically sending out electric beams that slowly spin around the arena, avoidable by climbing on objects or taking cover behind blast shields. Perhaps halfway through the fight, once you've destroyed all the cannons, you'd then move on to targeting Zeta herself. But surprise, she's surrounded by an energy shield, and now she's even started firing lasers at you from her eyes. So to disable her shield, you must target three randomized generators dotted around the arena, and target them all at once, testing your mastery of Gamma's main gameplay flow, in order to drain her shields and give you time to deal as much damage as you can. And what if, the lower her health gets, the more she starts charging up and firing bursts of homing energy blasts at you, in addition to her laser eyes? Naturally, you should be able to deflect any projectile-based attack of hers for even more damage and score. And last but not least, the beta fight. Similar to your first fight, he should fight you with a combination of offense and defensive agility, only even faster with more aggression, and also with the ability to shield and deflect projectiles just like you can at this point. Beta could still have a wide variety of attacks that he uses at random, firing rockets, swiping with his claws, dashing at you, firing balls of electricity which could emit an area of effect shock, and his powerful bombardments. 
Perhaps we can have Gamma arrive at the egg carrier and go through Hot Shelter while it's still at nighttime, making it so the beta boss fight can take place during a rosy sunrise, creating a different color palette from Amy's Zero boss and tinging a very emotional aura over this battle. As the fight goes on and as Beta loses health, he can start mixing these attacks together more rapidly and with less cooldown between them, keeping you quick-footed as you likewise mix together the abilities you should have mastered by now. As such, to facilitate the use of every ability the character can have at this point, there should be those same gaps in the arena as in Knuckles' Chaos 6 fight, where the fan below the glass casts gusts of upward air, giving you an opportunity to use Gamma's hover to gain height, as well as the pull a la Amy's fight, that you can use to evade his faster attacks and stay on the move. Gamma is a really fun character to think of ways to expand upon, given his use of explosive and crazy gadgets. So those are my ideas of how his gameplay can be made more meaningful and innately satisfying while remaining true to the mechanics used by other characters. And that then brings us to the elephant in the room, or cat in this case. I believe radically altering or cutting content in a remake should only be done as a last resort. Well, this is one of those times. Long story short, methodical fishing doesn't belong in a speedy action platforming game. Toss that fishing shit out of the window and like everyone else, give Big his own unique flavor of that delicious momentum-based platforming. The objective of the stages can still be about chasing after Froggy, but we just have to find creative ways to convey that goal in each level, like showing us where Froggy is or running off to. Since Big is a huge, round, and super strong dude Arino, his breed of momentum platforming can make use of his weight and strength. You could give Big the same ball roll move that Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles have when going fast, capable of building up momentum down slopes. And since Big weighs so much, you could use this to turn him into a giant-ass bowling ball that crashes through enemies and heavy obstacles. Bouncing up and back when crashing into a wall coming out of the ball roll. To facilitate building up speed, Big's acceleration and top speed should be similar to Amy's. Faster acceleration to compensate for lower top speed than the other characters, but still fast enough to feel good and quick-footed. Big's jump should automatically turn into a stomp that bounces you off of enemies similar to Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles. The thought of Big innocently hopping across several enemies while flattening them like Goombas makes me laugh. Big could benefit from very bouncy gameplay, making use of things like trampolines or spring pads to bounce high into the air, in which giving him the same belly flop attack from Heroes would be very fitting. Using the attack, you could make it so the higher you drop from, the more powerful it'll be. So heavy enemies or strong obstacles would encourage getting as much height as you can. But of course, how could you forget that Big loves fishing? He carries that fishing rod everywhere he goes, so let's see what we can do with it. In Sonic Heroes, Big could lob the other team members at enemies, making for an effective way of dealing with them from a distance, and a fun use of his fishing rod. So let's implement something similar to this. Just as with Tails' ring bomb and Gamma's bomb thrower, holding down a button should aim the fishing rod, automatically locking onto the nearest valid target, in this case, small enemy types. In which releasing it will have Big lasso the enemy and reel him in. After which you're free to press the same button and send him flying toward the nearest enemy in your path, causing a fun pinball effect as they smack together, hitting other nearby enemies enemies before blowing up. Another obvious thing you can do with Big's fishing rod is allow him to swing on those same poles Amy and Gamma use, allowing for a quick way for Big to gain speed and height, where timing and momentum is key to reach greater distances. In the original, there were a few points that had you picking up large, heavy objects, showing off Big's strength. This should be expanded into another option for dealing with enemies, having Big swiftly pick up stage assets like big bombs or boulders and hurl them into the path of bad guys, or into destructible pieces of the environment. Furthermore, what if we retooled the power rod of the original to allow Big to cast his line and grab these heavy objects more quickly, and from a distance, so then you'd be able to reach throwable assets you couldn't before and use them much more efficiently. Maybe even allow him to reel in and lob medium-sized enemies too. For Big's life belt upgrade, it'd be really fun and hilarious if you could rapidly inflate it while standing, sending enemies pinballing in different directions, while also giving Big his own way to deflect incoming projectiles like everyone else does. I think Big should also be able to swim by default, either working like how Tails would swim in this remake and holding the A button after a jump, or how Knuckles does in SA2. For the sake of giving the life belt a more fun and interesting use, let's have it function like Tails' tornado spin while underwater, launching Big up through the water rapidly, killing any enemies in his path, destroying any obstacles, and quickly gaining immense upward momentum. Think of it like a super jump that can be used when underwater, where the deeper you launch from underwater, the higher you'll go. This could be used to access high up platforms, and also blocked off ceiling passageways underwater. So with the life belt, pools of water effectively now become prime opportunities to bounce you super high into the air. 
Next, let's give Big a new power-up that again takes inspiration from Sonic Heroes, namely his umbrella that allowed him to slowly descend in the air. This could work identically to Gamma's hover, capable of preserving a bit of upward momentum, catching upward gusts of fans, but also in Big's case, positioning yourself over an anime or obstacle just right from high up to smash down onto them with a belly flop. This power-up can be placed just before Emerald Coast, in the hotel, where you use the cut beta puzzle of placing cubes into holes to obtain it. And for an added touch to the comedic tone of Big's story, I think it'd be funny if every level had its own result screen animation, showing Froggy escaping from Big in a slapstick and increasingly absurd way every time, with Big looking sad and defeated. With that, let's go into Big's levels. For his Twinkle Park, like the original, I think this level should start in front of the pool, where you can see Froggy trapped under some fragile grating at the bottom, setting up the goal of finding a way to get him out. So the objective becomes to climb all the way up to the top of the central castle and belly flop into the pool, sending all the water splashing out, giving you free reign to destroy the grating with a few more flops in order to access Froggy, ending the stage. Not only would this be fun and over the top, but it would also convey the belly flop's use of height for maximum effect. And for this stage, it should make use of the amusement park attractions, like Amy's level would. Big's character and moveset already fits with the high striker game, but you could also use his rolling move to literally become a bowling ball just like how Sonic does. Next, Big's ice cap. How about we open the stage on top of the mountain? in a fucking sled. In a high octane downhill ride being a parody of Sonic's snowboard section, where it'd control the exact same being able to jump and launch off trip ramps and all. Maybe even have enemies in your path that you'd run over. And after this section, you'd continue through the stage on foot. Big's ice cap was already absurdly intricate with lots of areas with tons of verticality. So now we can use all that for actual platforming. Since this level takes place midday and you'd exit it at night, how about we have the upper parts of the stage taking place on the surface, have a sunset bathing the ice in a rich orange hue. Then, when we descend into the icy depths, we can have that same ghostly purple as in the original game. In the original, there were a few sheets of ice you could smash through by jumping into them, or by throwing a boulder at them. We should expand this concept, in which the idea can be used in all sorts of ways to encourage creative uses of Big's abilities, like gaining enough height to belly flop through breakable ice on the floor, or gaining enough momentum with Big's spinball to crack through walls of ice, or by lobbing stage assets into them like boulders, either by manually throwing them or with the power rod. I'm imagining this being put to use in underwater segments too, where finding an object to throw is much more tense given your limited airtime. And since the level would be so intricate and vertical, this would be a great stage to show off how far the life belt underwater super jump can get you. Then maybe at the end of the level you could find Froggy trapped under an icy lake. So you have to climb up to the highest platforms in which you need to smack ice stalactites down, dropping them onto the floor and gradually cracking the ice below, eventually breaking and allowing you to access Froggy. For Big's Emerald Coast, the level should focus on spanning a large amount of space, where you can find plenty of creative and fun ways to cross between the many islands and boardwalks using Big's bouncy abilities. But in particular, I'd love to see this water cave of the original be expanded to full-on sections, where you can find lots of alternate paths via underwater passages, which would whisk you through areas faster than on the surface, plus giving Big's Emerald Coast areas unique to him. And I can't help but feel we need to take advantage of the whale from Sonic's version in some funny way. Okay, so what about the start of the level? You could see the whale jumping in and out of the water nearby, with Froggy hitching a ride on it. So the objective effectively becomes to chase the whale down throughout the level. And then, what if at the end of the level, when you finally corner the whale, you could latch on to a bucket of chum and swing it over the water in order to lure it and Froggy over to you and end the stage? I shouldn't be allowed to do this. Since Big only had four levels in the original, let's give him Lost World like Gamma, which could have a section involving the same serpent chamber that Sonic went through, only this time in reverse. The objective here becomes to drain all of the water from the room by hitting the same switches in consecutive order. The reason being, right in the middle and bottom of the room is a hole blocked by some debris that you must belly flop onto from high up. As you have to make your way down, with the last switch being on the lowest walkway, there should be lots of poles you can latch onto to then swing yourself all the way back up. After this section, you could have a segment featuring the same downward pathway in Sonic's version of the level. What's more, you could see Froggy here before going down, and wish you will run away. And you're encouraged to roll down after him. Meaning, yes, Big has become the boulder, and Froggy has become Sonic. Lastly, for Hot Shelter, this level should make use of every one of Big's major moves. It could feature grabbing objects to swing or rolling down slopes to break the glass of the surrounding aquariums in order to fill the area with as much water as you can, in order to reach higher platforms, either by raising the water to their level or making the water deep enough to use the Life Belt Super Jump to reach them. 
Between these sections focusing on platforming and verticality could be these twisting and turning pads in the mechanical bowels of the egg carrier that give you opportunities to build up lots of speed and crash through enemies, rolling through like the madman you are. To give this climactic element a big spinal stage where he's willing to wreck as much of Eggman's shit as he has to to get Froggy back. Ooh, and there we have it. Those are my ideas for rebuilding Big into a platforming character, deserving of standing amongst the rest of the roster. Not only making fun use of his weight and passion for the rod, but also adding a comedic element to ensure his gameplay and story puts a smile on your face. And so we come to the supersonic story. Not much more than an epic climax to the story, and an exciting boss fight in OG, I'd like to give the other characters much more of a role here. So, similar to how the last story in 06 saw every character in search of the Chaos Emeralds in order to resolve the crisis at hand, the same should be done here. After Chaos absorbs the power of the Emeralds, every character other than Sonic should all be given segments in one giant last level in the flooded ruins of Station Square seeking them out, called Capital Torment. Swapping between the characters at regular intervals, there'd be two segments for Tails, two segments for Knuckles, two segments for Amy, and one segment for Big. Since there's lots of water to use, the characters with abilities relating to water can see some fun use here. Tails can use his rhythm brooch when underwater to launch himself high into the air to reach higher platforms, Knuckles can use his drill thrust to tear through rubble and debris while swimming, and Big can take advantage of all the pools of water to bounce all around using his life belt's inflation. For Amy, who doesn't have any special mechanics relating to water, her challenge can be about using her floaty acrobatics to stay out of the water, hopping from platform to platform and swinging off poles. As for specific challenges for each character, you could have segments with Tails and Knuckles about flying or gliding through a segment with lots of small hurricanes that will suck you in, so you must skillfully navigate around them. Perhaps for Big, we can have Froggy following them around since he's returned to normal, just like how Amy is followed by a bird. And we could take a page out of her gameplay's book and have Froggy reward combo scores with power-ups that would be important in clearing challenges, such as speed shoes or invincibility. And to facilitate building up combo score, we can have special enemies called Chaos Spawn, watery enemies that gang up and attack the characters, similar to the Iblis monsters in Sonic 06. I'm sure we're all familiar with how the abrupt change from Open Your Heart to a more tense disaster piece and the final boss was underwhelming, so for this entire chapter of gathering the emeralds as the other characters, we can instead use that track here, then allowing us to use Open Your Heart for the entirety of Perfect Chaos, which we'll go and do now. In the original, the boss fight required you to maintain a high level of speed while avoiding hazards to actually damage Chaos. So that should be expanded upon, where you can't as easily gain speed simply by jumping, meaning the emphasis is more so on keeping a smooth flow and hitting as many dash pads as you can. And like in the original, the lower Chaos's health gets, the more aggressive his attacks should become. Maintaining rings should also be made more relevant here, either with ring count depleting at a faster rate, or with less rings available to pick up, or by making the boss fight much longer. And at that, you should still be able to use the light speed dash here, allowing you to immediately gain all rings lined up in a path and increase your speed if you angle the move just right. I'm particularly fond of how Sonic Generations shook up this fight with different phases. So we can add in intermittent phases where you're platforming across rooftops and hopping across water geyser lifted platforms in order to reach chaos, all while debris and energy spears are being launched at you. The boss fight should generally be made longer and more difficult so that it's more engaging and satisfying as a final boss, and to give Open Your Heart more time to play. An exciting and epic final boss does wonders for leaving players with a satisfied taste of the game after finishing it, so doing this final chapter of Sonic Adventure justice is massively important. So, there it is. A big box of ideas of how these special six can be improved in a Sonic Adventure remake. Further fine-tuning and balancing Sonic's speedy momentum, adding simple limitations to Tails' flight while extending his stages, Expanding the scale of knuckle stages with more rewarding diversions, fleshing out Amy's bouncy acrobatic platforming through a wider breadth of content, channeling Gamma's mechanics and stages to use more speedy momentum to complement his lock and shoot loop, and transforming Big into a fast paced, bouncy, and endearing momentum platformer. All using a set of versatile stages filled with lots of slopes, branching pathways, and sprawling vertical level design. Hopefully this gush of ideas hasn't been too overwhelming, and there's only so much I can do as an artist to convey these ideas without actually being a game developer. But at the very least, I hope I've shown just how much potential these characters have to be something truly special. But buckle up, because there's still plenty more aspects of the gameplay to cover. So take a bathroom break and grab a cup of tea, and we'll get going once again.
Now that we've covered the main aspects of each character's gameplay, let's move on to some of the more specific elements of the game. One of Sonic Adventure's flaws was, between playing all the stories back to back, you'd be faced with a lot of repetition. In this case, shared boss fights feature very little diversity in how they play between each character, so we should take steps to ensure that the bosses offer unique challenges and behaviors depending on the abilities of each character that fights them. Let's start with the Egg Hornet. As Sonic is a simple case of evading the attacks until Eggman gives you an opportunity to strike, making use of Sonic's hide speed. For Tails, let's tweak things to where Eggman unleashes a napalm attack onto the arena, covering large sections of the ground in flames in which you must fly over to a safe place. Then you could take those same missiles Eggman fires and allow you to deflect them with Tails' tail attack, even capable of being redirected toward Eggman for some chip damage. And then we have the infamous Chaos 4 fight. One thing's for sure, and that's that we need much less of a focus on waiting for Chaos to make himself vulnerable and more player agency. Basically, more opportunities to deal damage. A good behavior to allow for this, between all the characters, would be when not attacking, Chaos would swim in a wide circle around the arena, leaping up and down in the water like a dolphin, giving you a chance to chase him down and strike him whenever he's above water. Given Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles vastly different methods of traversing the environment, this behavior alone already makes for some fun variation between each character when it comes to chasing Chaos. In particular, Sonic's bounce attack could bounce you up higher than usual when done on the lily pads, making for fun, bouncy traversal innovation of the boss. In the same vein, the ball attack from the original can return and be used for all characters. But I think it would be fun if we reworked it into requiring you to hit each ball twice to destroy them, where striking them can then send them pinballing around the arena or even hitting each other. Next, we should give them different behaviors between each character. For Sonic's version of the fight, take advantage of the fact that Sonic's weakness is water and have a strong emphasis on staying atop the footholds because if you fall in the water, chaos will aggressively start coming for you. To get back to the surface, there should be rocks to jump on or ramps leading back up. For Tails' version of the fight, chaos could send big ripples through the water which would throw you off the footholds, so you must fly in order to avoid being thrown into the water. Chaos could also have a similar attack in the original where he splashes water at the player which would knock you out of flight. He should do the same here, only using Tails' tail attack would protect you from being stunned by it. Chaos should also have a move in which he flies up high into the air and hovers in the center of the arena, in which he will then begin shooting energy pulses down at you. When he does this, you must climb up a tree located in the arena and fly to him while evading his attacks, hitting him with the tail attack to send him back down. Then for Knuckles' fight, you can make use of his drill dive to allow Knuckles to hit Chaos while he's underwater, if you position yourself just right. Chaos can also have an attack in which he forms a hurricane and chases after you, but you can climb that same tree mentioned and drill dive into the heart of it to score a hit on him and stop the attack. Now on to Chaos 6. For all characters, the boss should be made a greater threat through faster and more aggressive attacks as the fight goes on, with more freedom when it comes to how you can damage the boss. For Sonic's version of the fight, it should be all about keeping your distance, as getting in close will result in him gobbling you up and spitting you out. And similar to King Boom Boo in SA2, you can have parts where Chaos is aggressively chasing you down, where you must run like your life depends on it. To expand on this idea of using Sonic speed to stay away, Chaos can perform a spinning attack with his newly reformed tail, in which you must run from it while jumping over extensions of his body shooting out. To go along with the idea of Knuckles being able to deflect Chaos' attacks, we can give Chaos the same spinning tail move as in Sonic's version, only much faster and unavoidable. So you must deflect the incoming attack with Knuckles' punches, sending it spinning in the other direction, where you must keep deflecting it, the attack becoming faster with each deflection until it ends. For Knuckles and Big's versions of this fight, you can give Chaos an attack that covers the entire floor of the arena, where you must use holes in the glass and the gusts pushed up from them to carry you upward while using Knuckles' glide or Big's umbrella for the duration of the attack, made more difficult by energy spheres chasing you. For all characters, you should have more room to freeze Chaos with the nitrogen capsules Eggman drops much more freely. More about finding windows to use them between Chaos' flurry of attacks than waiting for designated phases. To that end, I think it would be more fun if, instead of picking up and throwing the capsules, Sonic could hit them with the spin dash in order to fling them at Chaos, placing much more emphasis on your angling. Knuckles would have to lure Chaos in close, and destroy the capsules with a punch right before he comes in to gobble you up, emphasizing timing. Big should be able to latch onto the nitrogen capsules with his fishing rod and lob them toward Chaos, only for him you must ensure it lands in his mouth. When Chaos is frozen, you should still be able to deal more damage using the Light Speed Attack or Maximum Heat Knuckles Attack, but with a much shorter stun time for Chaos, meaning using the technique requires more precise timing when risking losing out on damage. Once you strike the frozen Chaos, he will shatter into several smaller pieces of ice, where you must damage and destroy as many as you can before he recovers, dealing further chip damage. 
On the topic of boss fights, that now brings us to the character battles. Like Gamma's boss fights, these two were laughable in how easy it was to stunlock the opponents and end the fights in under 10 seconds. Naturally, we should look to increase the difficulty and engagement of these fights, but ideally still keep things short and simple. In this case, I think looking to how SA2 handles the fights would be a good idea, where the characters will deflect your attacks by jumping or blocking with their own moves. So the focus would be on getting them vulnerable, like when they're in the air, or hitting them from behind. You can tailor the number of hits required to win depending on how difficult or long you want the fight to be. For when you face off against Sonic, you can have parts of the fight where he's evading you using his speed, so the focus here is on catching him in order to land a blow. For facing Knuckles, you can have segments where he's aggressively attacking, putting you on the defensive, and encouraging you to block by jumping or attacking, or to evade. For facing against Gamma, he could block your frontal attacks with his quick shield, so have it be about outmaneuvering his flurry of weapon blasts and leading his projectiles back to him. Maybe he could also make use of his bomb thrower power-up. Then, what if we added another character battle? Gamma vs. Big. The same behaviors would apply when facing Gamma when playing as Big. But when playing as Gamma, we could give Big a beefy health bar. It'd be a balancing game of managing distance, getting too close will cause him to try to belly flop you or send you flying away with his life belt, but get too far away and he starts chucking rocks at you using his fishing rod. And he's always shrinking or widening the gap between you on his own to keep you on your toes. He'd be capable of deflecting frontal attacks with his life belt, but would be vulnerable when attacking or using his fishing rod. So, improving these boss fights is simply a matter of improving them on their own through more player agency, complexity and difficulty, and implementing unique behaviors that take advantage of the unique character abilities. Along with its multiple characters, Sonic Adventure complemented the main gameplay through fun and simple minigames. So let's go into the notable ones and see if we can make any improvements to enhance the difficulty or innate satisfaction. First up is Sky Chase. And one thing's immediately sure, and that it should be made unique between Sonic and Tails, since in the original there was literally no difference between them and their stories. So for Sonic's, have it be short, but still the same on-rail shooting as in OG. You can set the machine gun and laser to different buttons, and take inspiration from how Halo Reach handles this type of thing. The machine gun would be used to take out weaker targets, but also drain enemy ships' energy shields which the laser is then used for finishing off those stronger targets. Building combo scores will be put to good use here as well, where the more enemies you kill within a short time frame, the higher score you'll be rewarded. And at that, if you score over, say, 1000, you can be given a speed boost to be used at any time you choose. Meaning the more enemies you destroy, the faster you'll be able to complete this otherwise on-rails minigame. On the other hand, for Tales of Sky Chase, since we've established the basics of how the weapons and scoring work, I think that allows us to add more complexity in allowing for full control of the plane. Accelerating, slowing down, and strafing with the left stick, aiming and changing directions with the right stick. And since you have full control, the objective here can now be a combination of taking out a certain number of enemies and destroying enemy generators located on parts of the egg carrier, in which they could have energy shields protecting them that you have to drain with the machine gun for you to then finish them off with the laser. For both Sonic and Tails' second Sky Chase, you could make more use of stronger enemies using energy shielding, with more defense cannon shooting spikes put in place. For both Sonic and Tails' second Sky Chase, after the tornado transforms into battle mode, you could have a refresh to the health bar, a lower cooldown between laser blasts, and the turbo mode would be even faster and capable of blasting through incoming fighters, granting you temporary invulnerability. For Sonic's last segment in Act 2, you'd go to the Egg Carrier's main cannon and take it head-on, avoiding its laser blasts and defense cannons while firing right into its cannon to destroy it, just like in the original game, while being more difficult through less predictable firing patterns, emphasizing risk versus reward and dealing versus avoiding damage. But for Tails' last segment here, how about we throw a curveball and have a giant-ass robot dragon fly out of the Egg Carrier's main cannon, specifically the dragon boss that was cut from the original game. Here we have a fantastic opportunity to re-implement this lost, badass, three-headed boss that would give Tails' Sky Chase a unique edge with this one-on-one -on -one encounter. A dragon would chase you and make an effort to stay within your field of vision to give you clear shots. You could damage it by shooting any part of its body, but it'd take big chunks of damage with each head destroyed. Every head is coated in energy shielding, so you must apply the combination of machine gun and laser fire detailed before. Each head fires its own set of projectiles, and destroying the center head will instantly kill the behemoth but doing so would require taking out the other two heads first. That then brings us to the Twinkle Circuit kart racing, including the first act of Sonic's Twinkle Park. Since the carts count the number of rings collected, I think it would make sense to have it so the more rings you collect, the faster you go. And any time you'd hit a hazard, you'd only lose about 20 rings or so. 
Since every character has the opportunity to go into Twinkle Circuit, there should be unique racetracks for each one that you unlock upon playing them. With that, just like SE2's kart racing side mode, Twinkle Circuit should have a multiplayer functionality, simply the ability to play with up to four or so other people. In the same vein, I'd also love to see a simple ghost racing multiplayer mode for all of the characters' stages. All of you playing a stage at the same time, where you can see the others in the form of colored silhouettes and a racing bar showing each player's progress. Where you'd compete with your friends to see who can get the highest rank at the end or complete the stage the fastest. I think the truly robust multiplayer racing content should be saved for an SA2 remake, but a simple ghost racing mode a la Mario Kart with your friends would be nice nonetheless. For both that and the Twinkle Circuit multiplayer, players could be rewarded rings and items for use in the Chow Garden, with the most rewards being given to the player in first place or with the highest score. Obviously, all the gameplay ideas I've suggested so far with the characters and minigames would be subject to change. Without actual implementation and playtesting, there's no way of knowing for sure if everything I've come up with would work out, but nevertheless, I've done my best to provide fun and creative ideas that complement, expand, and improve upon each character's playstyles to create a more content-rich, engaging, and cohesive game as a whole. Sonic Adventure is defined by its multiple different characters with their own fun, unique abilities and simple little minigames, so they deserve nothing but the utmost care and attention when it comes to re-examining how they could work in a remake. Likewise, another strong part of SA1's identity is its adventure fields. Small and simple, but super detailed and memorable hub worlds filled with power-ups, emblems, and a ton of NPCs with dialogue and stories that change depending on your progress in the story. These hubs served to bring the Sonic world to life in a way we'd never seen before, while tying all the levels together in a really neat way to give a sense of, well, adventure. So like with everything else, let's expand on the strongest aspects. There should be more unique NPC dialogue and stories per each character. This was already done to a degree in the original game, where Knuckles could ask people about the whereabouts of the Master Emerald Shards, Big could ask about Froggy, and Gamma could scare the shit out of people. So I'd love to see more of this, and ideally use this as an opportunity to make references to other games. For example, there's a piece of dialogue that was changed in Sonic's story, from a boy talking about his exploits in saving Little Planet and Angel Island from CD and 3K. In general, there should be more NPC dialogue that gives us insight into the finer details of the Sonic world. I'd also love to see more unique dialogue from the echidnas between each character who visits the ancient city, that give us more insight into the facets of their culture. Imagine even being able to find and talk to Pekka Kamek briefly that can give us a deeper look into his plundering motivations. You know how partway through the story there's always this strike at the train station that prevents you from going to the Mystic Ruins? Wouldn't it be cool if it was an actual strike with lots of people gathered around, and the train station employees chanting and holding up signs? And lastly, on the topic of NPCs, we should be able to talk to the robot helpers aboard the Egg Carrier, where they could have funny dialogue that bolsters Eggman's insanely bloated ego. And speaking of Eggman, his bass should have a unique music track, instead of simply using the final Egg music. For the sake of better believability, the Angel Island landmass should be placed way farther away from the train station. Because I find it super hard to believe that an entire island falling from the sky would leave a little rickety old train platform literal feet away completely undamaged. And while we're talking about it, characters like Sonic and Tails should react to Angel Island having fallen back down in some way. Like, upon approaching it, there could be a prompt to activate dialogue where they express their shock that it's fallen back to the Earth again. Angel Island while we're cleaning up things like that, I think it'd also be cool to have the Egg Carrier visible from Station Square in the Mystic Ruins after it's crashed into the ocean. Likewise, you should be able to see both locations from the Egg Carrier too. When it comes to how these hubs work in the grand scheme of the game, they serve very little gameplay value, at most giving you a sterile environment to get used to the controls and housing character upgrades, most of which are mandatory anyway. But that was okay. Where Mario 64's castle mostly served as a hub for selecting levels, Sonic Adventure used its adventure fields to further contextualize the plot and stages, and develop the series' world into something more tangible than most other games at the time. Given SA1's strong emphasis on story and characters, these hubs lacking the gameplay value the actual stages provided was okay. But for this remake, it would be even better if these hubs did have more gameplay value, and there are a number of ways we can go about achieving that. Mario 64 and Sunshine's hubs served as levels in their own rights, with a lot of platforming gameplay opportunity and tons of collectibles to be found. So here you could add to these maps many more curated platforming opportunities that allow you to play around and experiment with the character abilities, like a chill playground. Simple stuff like ramping slopes to mess around with momentum physics, assets to bounce across in a chain, places for Knuckles to dig up items, and bodies of water to play around with the many new water-related upgrades. 
In a lot of games, the prime thing that makes hubs meaningful to engage with is some form of progression system like in RPGs. Finding collectibles and engaging with side quests, which allow you to level up and grow stronger, making exploring feed into the primary drive that is character progression. It should come as no surprise that SI1 began life as an RPG, which is why there are so many RPG-like elements here as it is. So if we were to theorize, what would a progression system look like for an SI1 remake? I'm recalling Unleashed System in particular where throughout the game you'd use XP gained from playing the game to level up Sonic's abilities. So in SA1's case, XP would be awarded from completing stages and bosses, bolstered by the end rank received. But to give the hubs more value in particular, you'd find these sort of XP clusters hidden all over, especially in places inaccessible without certain upgrades. And you'd engage with missions given to you by NPCs, completing a unique platforming challenge, a brain teaser, or a straight up enemy rush, making it so the hubs serve as platforms to progress your character and level up after gaining enough XP, where you then choose how to spend it. Increasing the power of a character ability like the Spin Dash, Tail Spin, or Hammer Strike, or the power of an upgrade like the Drill Thrust, Life Belt Super Jump, or Quick Shield. To centralize and ground the system, you could maybe spend level up points at a rustic shop run at the train station in the Mystic Ruins. Now, implementing RPG progression into SI1 would require fundamental reworks to how the game is built and paced. SA1 is structured to where the hubs merely complement the meat that is the story in endlessly replayable stages, so stuff like RPG progression and side quests might be beyond the scope of this remake. But I am admittedly very curious how these elements could make the campaigns themselves uniquely replayable compared to SA1's simple trial mode. And that said, SA1 already has potential for side quests through the character upgrades. In Sonic Story, various NPCs mentioned a pair of shoes less than the sewers, pointing you toward the light shoes. What if every upgrade was made completely optional and similarly hinted at by NPCs, essentially giving every upgrade its own side quest to obtain? NPCs could drop tidbits of info on landmarks to look out for or tasks to complete in order to find hidden upgrades, encouraging exploring the hubs and engaging with its content in order to find new toys which open up new ways to play the main stages. Of course, making every upgrade Upgrade optional would mean reworking the stages and the story progression to be played without them. But if done right, this reframing of the upgrade system into little scavenger hunts could make the player feel more rewarded for engaging with these hubs that have been so lovingly crafted. Regardless of what kind of overhauls you make to the adventure fields, we can give exploring them more value by adding many more collectibles hidden all over, especially in places only accessible by certain characters, meaning you need to keep them in mind. Kind of like how Unleashed Hubs has a bunch of nooks and crannies only accessible once you obtain a certain power-up. The collectibles should be more emblems or chow-related items like eggs, hats, seeds, etc. And with that, we have a good segue into the lovely can of worms that is the Chow Garden. The pet raising system with an insane amount of complexity when it comes to customizing your chow, in which replaying the main game is required to gather animals to boost their stats, and rings to buy helpful items. Effectively, the chow garden works at its best when it's complementing the main game and encouraging you to replay stages. When it comes to how we can expand and improve on the chow garden in SA1, the thing that immediately comes to mind is taking notes from SA2, and how it added the ability to view chow stats, buy items, and improved massively on the raising system. A lot of this stuff was backported to the DX version of SA1, but the game still lacks certain features that make SA2 the superior platform to raise Chow. So, like SA2, the Chow Garden here should have ways of viewing the meta stats of a Chow, such as its personality, stat grades, and so on. But if there's one thing I'd say plague the Chow Garden in both games, it would be the absurd amount of grinding necessary to do well in races. The amount of stat gain you'd receive from an individual animal was minuscule. Thankfully, a glitch came to the rescue in both games, allowing you to repeatedly use the same animal over and over. However, ideally, we wouldn't need to use this type of exploit at all. So, the stat system should be rebalanced to be much less grindy, while still taking time and feeling meaningful. This can be achieved through a combination of things, like allowing you to carry more animals, allowing you to use the same animal two to three times, and increasing the amount of stat gain per animal given, similar to a very nice option in the mod loaders of both games. And while we're raising Chow, it'd be cool if there was a much more meaning in the characters we use in the process. What if we were to give each character a small multiplier to a certain stat whenever they give a Chow an animal? So, Sonic could boost Run by a small amount, Tails Fly, Knuckles Power, Big Swim, and then we could do something more specialized with the last two. 
Gamma could be run and power equally, Amy could be swim and fly equally. Because the way Chao evolution works, the more of a stat it gains at a time, the more it moves toward it on a sort of grid. This is called stat influence. Independent from its actual stat levels, it changes how your Chao evolves over time. And because of the nature of that grid, that means while you can raise all stats equally if you wish, your Chao can't have equal influence of two opposing stats. In this case, Run is opposite of Power, and Swim is opposite of Fly. So in giving Gamma and Amy equal influence in their respective opposing stats, that allows you to keep your Chao's stat influence perfectly balanced, allowing you to more easily maintain a true neutral Chao. And to further facilitate this, there should be two new types of animals introduced that do the exact same thing. So let's say for Run and Power, we can introduce a Panther, and for Swim and Fly, we can introduce a Puffin. So what you would do if you wanted to make a neutral Chao while still raising its stats, would be using Gamma to give it lots of Panthers, and Amy to give it lots of Puffins. Moving on to the different types of Chao you can get, almost every type of Jewel Chao should be obtainable in-game as special rewards for having a high amount of emblems when going to the black market, or as prizes won from races. One thing that could benefit in SA1 Remake's Chao Garden would be introducing new unique breeds. Similar to how making Chaos Chao requires a very specific set of actions to perform over a Chao's life, you could introduce new breeds with special requirements to create. For example, a way we could do this is having a rare type of nut that has a small chance of growing from the default trees in the garden. These would give a higher stamina gain when fed to your Chao than normal nuts. And when fed enough of these, if your Chao is still within the neutral stat influence, it could evolve into a special breed with a unique look once it becomes an adult that gains stamina at a significantly faster rate than other Chao. Maybe even with a longer stamina bar in the races. We could call this, say, a Vigor Chao. After it evolves, it would still change according to its stat influence it gets from there, just like the standard normal type Chao, while still keeping the unique visual attributes of this breed. And what if we could have an unlockable garden in the form of the ancient Master Emerald Altar, with the ability to create a very special Chao? Since all seven Chaos Emeralds would be present here, raising a neutral Run Run Chao, or Sonic Chao, in this garden would then create a special Super Sonic Chao that instantly receives an S rank to its Run stat grade upon evolving. Stuff like this to create exclusive breeds would help make SA1's Chao Garden unique from SA2, through having more of its own exclusive content. On the topic of stat gains, we all know how the Chao inherit parts of the animals they use, like wings from a parrot, paws from a bear, or horns from a ram. While this stuff is great and adds to the customizability of a Chao, sometimes you prefer your Chao not to have any animal parts at all. SA2 introduced the Skeleton Dog, which removed parts of animals on your Chao, a super helpful feature. So, the Skeleton Dog should be available to find in SA1 as well, maybe obtainable in Lost World and Red Mountain. And furthermore, I think there should be an item available from the black market that you can give your Chao to prevent them from inheriting animal parts altogether, with another item to reverse that change in case you change your mind. With that, let's talk about the black market. The one thing's sure, and that's that we should be able to buy more than one item at a time, like SA2. I'd also love to see it, as well as the races, accessible from the Mystic Ruins and Egg Carrier Gardens as well, so they're more palatable to use for raising Chao. A really cool new feature would be for us to have the ability to decorate each garden, using cosmetic items bought from the black market, one from races, and unlocked with emblems. We can customize our Chao, so why not extend that to apply to the gardens which they're raised to? One thing I found interesting is that, if your Chao is asleep and you attempt to enter them into a race, they'll still be super tired and will continuously fall asleep during the race. This meant I had to wait for them to finish their nap in the garden before they were ready to race. I think that was something that made my Chao feel more real than just a web of stats. So I'd love to see this kind of care system expanded on. Like, your Chao must be well fed first before entering a race, unless they constantly stop and rub their tummy, whining about how hungry they are. Chao in the original game will automatically run to a nut when hungry. We could make it so when no nuts are available to eat, your Chao's happiness will begin to drop the longer they go hungry for. However, to encourage pacing your Chao's growth, your Chao will only eat a certain amount of nuts before becoming full, and if you feed them more past that point, they have a chance to become sick. This is where SA2's Doctor feature can come into play, not just for viewing the metastats of your Chao, but treating them when ill, in this case for a stomach ache from eating too much. You could also have other dynamic illnesses that pop up every now and then, like a cold, fever, or cough that you'd need to watch out for as they would hinder your performance in races and decrease the happiness level for as long as they're sick for. I think small systems like these would encourage looking at your Chao as an actual pet to care for, less of a stat machine used to win races. On that note, let's talk about those races that put those stats to the test. The races in SA1 were super strangely designed, and I only recently came to understand how they actually worked. While yes, your Chao's stats of run, power, fly, and swim determine how well your Chao does in the race, there was more to it than that. Throughout the race, the camera will shift to a random Chao that may or may not be yours. 
in which tapping the jump button will allow you to cheer them on and give them a boost, regardless of whether or not it's actually your own Chow. I have no idea why it's like this, and it's really confusing. So let's rework the races to be more like as I do's, where the camera is always focused on your Chow, and they have a stamina bar reflecting their stamina stat. Pressing the jump button will allow you to cheer them on, using up some of that stamina. But like in SA2, beware, as running out of stamina will mean your chow runs much slower for the rest of the race. We could then expand on this system and make this cheering mechanic matter much more in moments where your chow truly needs it. Such as when they trip over or fail a task that uses the hidden intelligence and luck stats. Something I'm dying to see as well, is for each garden to have their own set of unique racetracks, themed after each one's locations. And maybe you should only be able to enter Chow into the races of the respective garden they were raised in. The reason being, this encouraged raising multiple Chow that give you an opportunity to use every garden, and see all the ways which you can customize them, rather than simply bulldozing the entire racing mode with a single Chow. This is something SA2 did similarly with the Hero and Dark races. In the original game, each of the jewel races tested each of the different stats. I'd like to see this taken much further with the fly, power, and swim races making much more use of those stats and less of run. The special opponents like Chiclon that can appear upon replaying the jewel races should also be used in their own unique races like in SA2. This would allow us to have a larger number of races to perform in order to 100% the Chow Garden content, while also avoiding SA2's issue of doing every race five times each. Games that have vibrant communities and large lifespans are often ones that allow for lots of creativity. But what's just as important is the ability to share that creativity. As such, an SA1 Remake's Chow Garden should feature online functionality in allowing you to post and share your Chow and Chow Gardens online, where other people can visit and have a look at your Chow and Garden, and so can you to theirs. And of course, Chow Racing and online multiplayer is an absolute no-brainer. We should be able to match up with our friends online and race each other's Chow, ideally with rewards to be used in the gardens only obtainable via doing these online races. I imagine giving much more emphasis to online community for the Chow Garden would synergize wonderfully with the two simple multiplayer modes brought up before, in the Ghost Racing and Twinkle Circuit. Imagine you and your friend group all engaging in this brand new remake's Chow Garden at the same time, sharing your Chow and Gardens, racing each other, and swapping tidbits of info. And since the Chow Garden at its core is all about encouraging replaying the main game, this gives you and your friends an excellent reason to play the ghost racing mode to gather rings and animals together. The mode could even compile together everybody's total score in that stage, and use it to output bonus rewards much higher than compared to just playing the stages alone, furthering your individual Chow endeavors together as one. This remake would also make a great opportunity to continue the legacy of the Dreamcast VMU, which could be used on the original release to name your Chow, view their stats, and battle and breed with your friend's Chow upon connecting with their own VMU. This kind of stuff is ripe for smartphones, which we can aptly name the Chow Adventure app. It could have its own mini garden, similar to the tiny Chow Garden in Sonic Advanced, that you could put your Chow from the SA1 remake into, where you can care for them like you can in the main game. Through this app, we could have the same features from the old VMU, a battling with other people's Chow, a la SA2's Chow Karate perhaps, using the stats in a similar way, and of course breeding, in which, just like in the VMU, the Chow bred from this could have a stat boost higher than if they were bred in the main game. We could also take the VMU minigames and rework them into ones with multiplayer functionality, that, like with the races in the main game, use your Chow stats to determine how well they'll do. For example, we could have a minigame in which your Chow fishes, using your Chow's power and swim stats. Or sort of a constant running side-scrolling minigame, where you must also run over large gaps. This would use the Chow's run and fly stats. These minigames could have rewards like animals so that you may continue to raise your Chow even out of the main game. You could also have rewards exclusively gained through this app that would then be used in the main game's gardens. Among these rewards could be rare items that give your Chow to allow for Tails, Knuckles, Amy, Big, and Gamma to make Chow that look like them. Where before Tails, Knuckles, and Amy Chow were only obtainable via exclusive events, we can re-implement these super rare breeds of Chow to be obtainable here. If you want to get super cheeky, you could even have a reward in the form of a robotic egg that would hatch an Omo Chow. This Chow Adventure app could be used to port your Chow between the SA1 remake and a potential SA2 remake. As such, I believe everything in this game's Chow Garden should be designed with forward compatibility with an SA2 remake in mind. And since there would be unique content between both games' gardens, such as SA1 having access to unique animals and colors of animals, jewel Chow, and breeds of Chow, it would provide a much more expansive system, encouraging using and swapping between both games' versions of the gardens. I've said it in the past, the Chow Garden is amazingly unique among side modes and games. Because of how insanely creative you can get with the Chow and how deep the systems here can get, you're encouraged to constantly replay the main game and to become knowledgeable about it in order to truly make the Chow that you want. 
When you merge that creativity with online functionality, you can create a game with strong staying power through an invested community. Lastly, for the gameplay side of a Sonic Adventure remake, let's go over the extra and unlockable content, primarily handled through the emblem system. Collectibles that measure the completion of the game's content, obtained by completing the main game's levels, side missions, Chow Garden races, and more. The DX version of SA1 gave you a ton of the more obscure classic Sonic games as rewards, the more emblems you obtained. While these were really cool, I think it would be better for the emblem rewards this time around to reinforce the main game and give you new ways to play it. And what if we could turn the emblem unlocking system into a sort of shop? Specifically, a shop located in the Station Square Adventure Field, where you can spend your emblems on a selection of unlockable content, sort of in any order you want. Since you could see the extra content you'll unlock, it'd give you more incentive to actively gather emblems and keep you playing even after you've beaten the game. And as for the unlocking process itself, for the side missions in the original game, there were two other objectives per every character's stages that tended to be simple things such as gathering 50 rings or completing the stage under a time limit. I think these should be made more difficult and interesting, so we should rework the ring objective to require at least 200 rings, given how it's not hard to rack up ring count, and a much stricter time limit. And I think we should have the ability to complete more than one objective at a time when playing these stages, allowing you to tackle them all at the same time. I'd also like to see a wider variety of objectives between the characters and stages. The ring gathering objective makes a lot more sense for Knuckles, in which you're encouraged to seek out the rings and item capsules rather than simply coming across them in the more streamlined stages of Sonic. Another objective you could give to Knuckles missions, and Gamma's for that matter, would be to destroy almost every enemy, synergizing with the stage's encouragement of destroying them for score. Amy's side objectives could include racking up a certain amount of score from chaining together acrobatic maneuvers, and perhaps objectives about avoiding taking hits, or evading detection from zero in stages where that's actually possible, like avoiding being detected by seeker robots or hit by security lasers. Simply more shakeups and variety to the objectives on offer, I think can make emblem gathering in this way much more interesting. As has become tradition with modern Sonic games, I'd likewise love to see collectibles hidden in each stage, to be implemented in the form of the tried and true red rings. Cause it's always good to reward players who go out of their way to explore, and you can give even further value to looking around, as perhaps every stage can have three red rings scattered about, in which collecting them all in that stage will award you an emblem. This idea was inspired by a mod released by the Lovely Speeps Highway, which turns SA1's extra lives into emblems to collect, and a great showcase of how such a simple change can make exploring feel significantly more rewarding. For gaining all emblems in the original game, you could unlock the ability to play as Metal Sonic in place of Sonic. I'd love to see this kind of unlockable character swap done for every other character as well, with their own attributes that would be extensions to the character's strengths. So, Metal Sonic could have a faster acceleration, a higher jump height, and instead of the spin dash, the action button could encase you in a force field that would make you invincible and destroy enemies. You could unlock Cream in place of Tails, where you'd then be able to fly much longer and sick her pet Chow Cheese on enemies, allowing you to easily rack up combos. You could unlock Chaos Zero in place of Knuckles, whose punches would have a super long reach, possess a fast puddle mode of transport where you're invincible and would perform upward strikes upon exiting, and would swim through water super quickly. You could unlock Tikal in place of Amy, who could possess a Chow similar to Cream in place of Birdie. Tikal could have an even higher jump at top speed, and the Chow would yield better power-ups for chaining together score, and perhaps the Chow could even take on the appearance of the last Chow you interacted with in your own garden. Then, for Gamma, what if we could swap him for the previously unused character found in Eggman's base? What I presume to be Mecha Sonic! Having the same acceleration and top speed as Sonic, and swapping out the Quick Shield for the Spin Dash, acting as a sort of blend between Gamma and Sonic's gameplay styles. You'd still be able to blast and bomb enemies, as well as hover using Mecha Sonic's shoe jets. Once again, finding a meaningful way to implement a cut piece of content from the original game in a neat and fun way. Here's where we are on the goofier side. For Big, I can't think of a better stand-in unlockable for this lovable fellow than the world-renowned, equally lovable Burger Shop Statue Man-Thing. Having all the same attacks and controls, only with the ability to transform any enemy into a hamburger when struck, yielding a randomized item or power-up upon being collected. And lastly, after completing the last story, you should be able to transform from Sonic into Super Sonic upon collecting 50 rings and hitting a certain button. 
where you would be much faster and jump much higher. Your rings would then count down, and if it reaches zero, you'd revert back to normal. Obviously, since these unlockable characters would be so OP, completing the stages as them shouldn't count toward your recorded rank. But I think you should still be able to use them to gather rings and animals for the Chow Garden, and let everyone use them in the ghost racing mode, as I think having these OP characters that makes it easier to gather resources serves as a cathartic and meaningful reward for game completion. There are some more ideas I have for fun unlockables as you gain emblems. You know how SA2 gave you Green Hill after gaining all 180 emblems? Well, wouldn't it be cool here if we could have an unlockable Emerald Hill Zone? using those classic Sonic 2 enemies and assets, and ideally designed so that every character is capable of playing through it. And also, like SA2, after completing all the side objectives of a stage, you should be able to unlock a hard mode version of it, with rearranged obstacles and enemies to provide a refreshed stage and more intense challenge. This last idea of an unlockable is inspired by a mod of SA1 that I love. A mod that flips the entire game's world and levels around, called Mirror Mode. After having played SA1 for years upon years, this mod allowed me to experience the entire thing as if it were new again. An unlockable Mirror Mode such as this would do wonders for the replayability of this game, especially when you pair it with the unlockable characters in the Hard Mode versions of each stage. As we conclude talking about this remix gameplay, there's one last thing I want to talk about. The Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure featured a lot of DLC that was distributed gradually via the console's online capability. A ton of stuff. It's actually absurd. This would come in the form of stuff like sponsored gameplay challenges and holiday decorations for the adventure fields. This kind of stuff is just perfect for an SA1 remake, given every gaming platform's easily accessible and widely used online capabilities. I can imagine special events being put into the post-game adventure fields of all kinds like those seen in the original game. But also unique stuff like perhaps new skins for the characters, new stuff for the Chow Garden, and so on. Whether how much of this stuff would be free or paid, I think SA1's DLC system is a no-brainer when it comes to how it would be adapted for a modern-day remake. Alright, that should do it for the gameplay side of Sonic Adventure. Ideas to expand and improve on each character, the adventure fields, the Chow Garden, and the unlockable content. All coming together to create an innately fun and satisfying game designed to be replayed for years to come, with lots of side content and unlockables to sink your teeth into, that complement the core gameplay. As you can tell, this is stuff I've thought about a lot, and it's because of my love for SA1 as it is, that makes me want to see it taken even further and refined for many years to come. But we're not done quite yet. There's still a whole other side of this game we've yet to open up. So take a break if you need one, but if you're as ready as me, let's continue. I'm pretty torn on this next subject, and that is the soundtrack. Sonic Adventure contains probably my favorite soundtrack out of any Sonic game, hell, any game ever. Composed primarily by Jun Zenoi, with many contributions from Kenichi Tokoi and Fumie Kumatani. The game's soundtrack featured a wide variety of tracks using styles like rock, jazz, and techno that captured the spirit of the adventure and atmosphere of the locations. Continuing the legacy of the 2D Sonic game's catchy earworms, while also introducing a heavier emphasis on hard rock and many more vocal themes to flesh out each character. Just playing the game, it should go without saying that the soundtrack is perfect. And as such, I don't see a need to re-record or replace it whatsoever. It'd be cool if we did get remasters of all the music, as long as we were able to swap back to the original, but personally I'd be 100% okay with the soundtrack remaining mostly untouched. I say mostly because, as I've mentioned before, there are parts of the game that would benefit from having new music tracks, like the third act of Sonic's Final Egg, Eggman's Bass, Skydeck Act 2, but in particular, I think we could really use more tracks for the cutscenes. As unlike the other music, the more synthesized sounds of the event pieces haven't aged as well, and the cutscenes could benefit greatly from a much wider breadth of tracks, reducing repetition of music, something which I'll go into shortly. Of course, when most people think of remakes of their favorite games, the first thing they think of would be the GRAPHICS, OH MY GOD! The reason I've waited this long to bring it up is because I believe nailing and improving upon the gameplay of the game is far more important a job of a remake. Sure, you can have a beautiful game that looks technically better than the original, but if you don't faithfully recreate and expand upon the core gameplay and features, then all you're doing is making a giant missed opportunity. But that said, hell yeah, I'd love to see Sonic Adventure rebuilt to take advantage of modern day technology and presentation. We've seen firsthand just how utterly fantastic this series can look with the highly polished visuals of Sonic Unleashed, and the amazingly colorful and creative aesthetics of Sonic Generations, which managed to blend every era of Sonic into one cohesive whole. 
Sonic Adventure already had a great art style, blending imagination and fantasy with grounded aesthetics to create a unique and interesting world, a sort of fantastical and imaginative version of the real world. This art style should definitely be maintained with the new graphics. The only lingering question here is, which version of SA1 should take precedent? Between the Dreamcast and DX versions of SA1, several locations and characters were redesigned. Graphical breaks from the DX ports aside, the art style between the versions really is up to personal preference. I prefer the darker and more vibrant colors of the Dreamcast version's environments, but the character designs of the DX version, because I think the DX characters better reflect and match the iconic artwork Yuji Uekawa created for the game. But as long as the updated graphics maintain the core imaginative but grounded style of the game, I'd be fine with either style. One thing an SA1 remake will definitely benefit from is new character models built from scratch. The models and designs that have been used ever since Unleashed, Colors, and Onward have honestly gotten really stale. The models and animation used aren't bad, but their expressions and body language is far too limited to live up to the potential for expression these characters have, especially in a remake of SA1 where the characters have plenty of opportunities for a wide range of emotions, ranging from utter shock, comical anger, serious anger, introspection, sadness, and happiness. So as such, I believe there should be new models created for every character for this remake, ideally made to capture the essence of the style of Yuji Uekawa's character designs. Where the characters can squash and stretch at the will of the animators to allow for fluid animations, the eyes can furrow and widen to more freely reflect the character's emotions, and the mouths can move freely around their face with a much wider range of ways to stretch and shape, rather than constantly being locked in one place and being super limited as in the modern games. New expressive models and animations would go a long way to not only flesh out the characters and make the cutscenes more engaging, but allow for a lot more potential in the ways which you can shake up the same scenes between different characters' stories. On that topic, the human NPCs are also important to Sonic Adventure in how they help build the world and flush out the adventure fields and give the characters something to defend and save. SA1's humans have a sort of 90s anime style to them, so that should be maintained, as that's the style the Anthro characters themselves take great influence from. I don't want to see anything wacky that makes Eggman look normal by comparison like in Unleashed, but nothing as boringly realistic as Sonic 06 either. The world is imaginative but grounded, and the humans should reflect that. I'd also love to see a few more Anthro animal NPCs among the townsfolk or explorers in the Mystic Ruins, just to nail the idea home that the Anthro characters and humans both coexist in this world. Characters I came up with include Glow the excessively fabulous Peacock, flaunting his style and spreading flattery and good vibes to everyone in Station Square. Then we have Eliza the Lizard, a serious-minded explorer trudging through the Mystic Ruins jungle, dead set on uncovering the dark secrets of the past and threatening anyone who would steal or destroy ancient artifacts. <coughs> Lastly, Rico the Goat, a socially withdrawn old man who runs the emblem shop in Station Square, who deep down seeks meaningful connection with other people in spite of his jaded, grumpy demeanor. These are just a few ideas of other Anthro characters that can inhabit the adventure fields and leave a memorable impact on your time spent there. The original game made use of CG cutscenes for big moments such as Angel Island falling, the egg carrier flying overhead, or the destruction of Station Square and I'd love to see what scenes like these could look like with modern-day CGI. Using Sega's CG studio Marza would be a great and easy choice, looking at how amazing their work on Unleashed and other Sonic games has turned out. On that note, the biggest area other than the gameplay where this game stands to improve is the cutscenes, that made heavy use of stock animations and canned lip-sync animations to get the job done. But the presentation of Sonic Adventure's story could obviously be fleshed out to be so much better. So, with care and attention put into unique handcrafted animations on brand new expressive models, that aspect of SA1 would instantly improve, and make these cutscenes much more impactful and interesting. If I had to pick out the biggest flaw of SA1's cutscenes, it wouldn't be the animations. Given competent performances, I actually feel they're pretty cute and quaint. Kind of like a kid playing with action figures, acting out a scene like so many other cutscenes of that era. But actually, I'd name the biggest flaw of the cutscenes to be the use of music. The background music in these cutscenes can get mind-numbingly repetitive, opting to use character themes and adventure field themes repeatedly. So, obviously, like mentioned before, the cutscenes could really benefit from a wider variety of newly composed music. Nothing on the level of Sonic Colors and Lost World's Mickey Mousing overly chipping background noise, just tracks that can be used across the game that are introspective, confrontational, happy, and so on. 
Considering how SA1 is constantly blaring music in its cutscenes, I find the scenes that don't have any music are a breath of fresh air that put the character personality squarely in the spotlight. So the cutscenes shouldn't be afraid to let scenes play out in silence either, where it'd be most effective. When it comes to how the music is used in SA1's cutscenes, it can really hurt the presentation value. Often the tracks would abruptly cut out and switch to a new one. The end of Tales' and Big Stories are goddamn ridiculous, having their theme songs start and restart twice before they actually get to play for their entirety in the credits. So it goes without saying that whenever a character's theme plays in their ending, it shouldn't just stop and restart. It should continue on into the end credits. How music, or lack thereof, contributes to the scene and how well it's mixed should definitely be a big focus when it comes to improving on Sonic Adventure's cutscenes. Because like I've said, it is their biggest flaw in my onion. Naturally, we'd all be super excited to see how SA1's narrative could be enhanced with modern cutscene presentation. But then that brings up a dilemma. With new animations comes new voice acting. Even if the cutscenes were reanimated around one of the original voice tracks, that would inevitably lead to the other voice track being made incompatible with the new animations. So either English and Japanese both need to be entirely re-recorded, or just English, with the Japanese cast re-recording or adding lines where needed. Considering how the English performances are super dated and how wonky, aimless, or over-the-top they sound, and how most of the Japanese cast has literally remained the same from SA1 to this day, English at least should definitely be re-recorded in its entirety. And by the same vein, the translation this time around should stay much more faithful to the original script. Especially as now there would be much more concrete, emotive animations to abide by. Basically, my philosophy when it comes to dubbing is that it should seek to replicate the meaning and emotions conveyed by the native version's script and performances, just through an English-speaking lens. So that said, while the execution of the performances was lacking, the casting for SA1's English cast was mostly on point, especially for Sonic, Knuckles, and Eggman. And while sadly Eggman's voice actor, Dean Bristow, is no longer with us, and neither is his Japanese voice, Chika Otsuka for that matter, an SA1 remake should strive to bring back the original voice actors where possible, as they are the ones that brought these characters to life in the first place, so they should be the ones to do it again, but even better through a modern day remake. Eggman's lines can be easily and effectively revoiced by his current voice actors Mike Pollock and Kotaro Nakamura, both fitting the character perfectly. But I'd love to see what kind of dark tone they could give him during Tails' cutscenes, like Bristow did so effectively. This is my dream come true. With this invention, I can expand the Eggman Empire across the globe and conquer the world! <laughs> Ryan Drummond, bar none, is the dream English voice of Sonic. Sounding nearly identical to Sonic's longtime voice actor Junichi Kanemaru in voice pitch and energetic yet flexible and cool cadence. And for this remake, Ryan should incorporate more of that energized inflection from his SI2 performance. Talk about low budget flights, no food or movies, I'm out of here. I like running better. Tails in both versions was voiced by young boys, both of them having questionable performances that tended to come off kind of flat. Since they can't return for obvious reasons, I'd be really excited to see how Tails' current adult actresses, either Colleen Oshinesi or Kate Higgins, along with Ryo Hirohashi, can elevate Tails' development arc in this game. There's still so many wisps in danger, thousands of them. I'm just not sure we can save all of them. Michael McGarren as Knuckles worked well as a counterpart to Nobutoshi Kana, but Scott Dreyer from SA2 would also be a good pick if he didn't return. Either way, I think Knuckles' English actor should channel the hot-blooded moments of Kana's performance more, without portraying the character as one-dimensionally gruff as with every performance since the Four Kids era. Right, give it your best shot! Taiko Kawata gave a breezy, innocent performance for Amy, while Jennifer Dulliard went with more of a snarky teen girl approach. She's a good fit, however, and she should easily be able to channel Kawata's more high-pitched, cutesy cadence. See, this little birdie's got in trouble. I think he should be his bodyguard a little while. Nee, 
John St. John has elevated Big to meme status in that he also voiced Duke Nukem. Sadly, Big's original voice actor, Shun Yoshido, passed away in 2003, so he would be voiced by his current actor, Takashi Nagasako. Big's performance in OG came off as dim-witted, especially in English, so in both voice tracks, I prefer if John and Nagasako performed him as less dumb and slow, but more jolly and friendly, so that the character is capable of appearing in more serious scenes without upsetting the tone. Gemma's English voice actor Steve Brody passed away in 2001. I don't have any particular ideas for a replacement, but it should be someone capable of channeling his and Joji Nakata's performances, with that deep, monotone, but gentle voice. Why try to save that which is useless to you? Does not compute. <laughs> Lastly, for character voices, Kaori Yasuo gave Tikal a sweet, caring, and emotive voice. Her English counterpart, Elara Dissler, was a good match in tone and cadence, but with proper direction and context given per scene, I'm sure she, along with every other actor in this remake, can improve upon their past performances and elevate the material. No one has the right to take their holy grounds! I beg you, Father! While we're on that note of revoicing and adding new lines, I'd love to see the character recaps actually voiced like they were in SA2. While the presentation and English voice tracks left a lot to be desired, the core story of SA1 is very compelling. Bringing the characters to life, expanding upon the world, and telling an unprecedented type of story for the series and other platformers at the time. If you ask me, the heart of Sonic Adventure's story lies in its cast of colorful and lovable characters. So nailing their personalities and the development of their arcs is key to ensuring the game's narrative is done justice. Along with that big facelift to the cutscenes production and entertainment value, in the original game, more so in English than Japanese, the dialogue and recorded lines would be different between every story. This is something that should definitely be expanded on and applied to both voice tracks. Having a different version of the dialogue, cinematography, and storyboarding for each character's story. Stuff like this can help make each story truly feel like a different perspective on the same events. To give some examples, in Knuckles' story, Sonic's cocky fruitcake aspect could be played up as Knuckles sees Sonic as an annoying show-off, while from Sonic's perspective, Knuckles' hot-headedness is played up, showing how Sonic loves to push his buttons. Amy and Sonic's scenes could come off as hyper and cheery, with Sonic comically put off by this, while in Amy's scenes, she's more level-headed and starstruck, and Sonic comes off as excessively cool and aloof. Tales in the original game's English track saw Eggman give off a more menacing performance, and I definitely want to see this emphasized. Him coming off as more cruel and evil in Tales' campaign, to show how intimidated he is by him. In this way, watching different perspectives on the same scenes would go from a formality thanks to the structure of the game, to a valuable aspect of understanding the different dimensions of all the characters. With that, the time has finally come for us to run through the story and explore ways we can expand on the plot, action, and character development. Starting with the intro CG cutscene playing before the title screen. I think it should be recreated as faithfully as possible to bring out those same heart-pounding, hype-inducing vibes the original gave off, while also playing its role as a promotion of sorts, showing you firsthand the stakes of this adventure and what you're trying to prevent. After that, I still think you should unlock character stories in the order of when you meet them in-game, meaning Sonic's story would be the only one available right from the start. So let's jump into it. Sonic's story serves the lofty role of introducing the characters, world, and conflict to the player, offering a strong and fun plot-driven narrative that brings what we know about the series from the 2D games to life, and sets the table for everything to come. All about the battle to stop Eggman from collecting all seven Chaos Emeralds, using them to make Chaos stronger and destroy Station Square. Just like how Sonic's gameplay is the main course, with the other characters being the seasoning and sides, so too does this apply to Sonic's story, where it sets up the plot for the other characters to take and expand upon to give you a more detailed understanding of everything at play. So with that said, most of what can be done here are simple revisions and cleanups. When Sonic and Amy get together midway through, they see the Eggman robot Zero roaming the city, only for Amy to get sidetracked and drag Sonic into Twinkle Park for a spur-of-the-moment opportunistic date. This scene is funny, but I'd like to see Sonic look back first before following Amy, only to see Zero has disappeared. So he glances back and forth, flustered at what to do, only to resign himself to chasing after Amy to ensure her and the bird's safety. 
This is simply to make it so it doesn't seem like Sonic is just ignoring Zero and letting him go loose in the city. Later, when we're chasing the Egg Carrier during Red Mountain, we should be able to see the ship at points during the level, like Wave Ocean in Sonic 06. This is just a personal wish of mine, but I'd like to see some reference to Hidden Palace Zones somewhere in this game. Ideally, somewhere in the second act of Red Mountain. I figure Angel Island has two Emerald Altars, the one underground from Sonic 3, and the one on the surface in this game. And considering how Lava Reef Zone and Red Mountain are both part of Angel Island, with lava-filled caves and lots of ancient mining equipment, they have to be in the same relative area. And since Lava Reef is right next to Hidden Palace, I think it would be really cool to see some sign of the underground Emerald Altar here. Like making the second act way more spacious and cavernous, where you're then able to see the ruins of Hidden Palace way off in the distant skybox. Some people don't understand why the egg carrier begins to lose altitude, leading it to eventually crash. But that becomes obvious once you realize Sky Deck takes place on the under and upper side of one of the ship's wings, and the stage goes out of its way to convey how much of it was damaged by Sonic and Tails' exploits. So to go along with this, you can show in the adventure field stacks of smoke rising from a more visibly damaged wing, even having Tails glance over to it once the ship begins to rumble to make the reason for its loss of altitude and eventual crash much more explicit. For the Chaos 6 fight, things should be reworked here to where Sonic, Big, and Knuckles are all present to fight Chaos at the same time, to give more of a climactic feel to the fight, and to drive the idea home that Chaos 6 is way too powerful for just one or two characters to take on. When Sonic falls from the crashing egg carrier, he lands right in front of the ancient ruins and entrance to Lost World. This feels too convenient, so instead Sonic should fall in some other part of the Mystic Ruins jungle, only for Tikal to have followed him off the egg carrier, in which she then leads him to the ruins. That's all I have for Sonic Story, as, like I said, it only needed a few touch-ups. Sonic Story serves as a simple, well-paced, and adventurous piece of the overall pie, Sonic himself being an entertaining and likable protagonist, free-spirited and cocky, yet prideful and introverted, with a certain wisdom to life and unique outlooks on any situation he's faced with, Sonic himself being the static, idealistic hero type of character, where the dynamic development is instead focused on how his strengths as a character affect the world and people around him, notably Tails. Tails' story featured an arc about him learning to run on his own two feet, rather than always relying on Sonic, and had the message of, even if you fail at times, you should still always believe in yourself, and in turn, your friends will believe in you. So, let's reinforce that message. At the start of the story, Tails is on the test run with a new model of plane using a Chaos Emerald as the power source. However, it goes wrong and the power transmission malfunctions, leading him to crash where he then has to be saved by Sonic. Here, we have a great opportunity to play around with that idea I mentioned of different perspectives on the characters. What if, in Tails' campaign, his lack of self-esteem and confidence in himself were drastically emphasized? To the point where he's so downtrodden that Sonic has to cheer him up and reassure him. But in Sonic's version of those same scenes, Tails is confident and upbeat, not letting his failure get to him, showing how Sonic sees Tails as a capable and valuable friend to have, so Tails' doubt in himself in his campaign is merely an act of self-sabotage that he needs to work past, considering it's not long before he fails again and even harder in being shot down by the Egg Carrier, in which the beloved tornado we've had since the very start ends up being destroyed. So in this scene, he's extremely frustrated and cursing himself over being so careless and underestimating Eggman. But remembering how much Sonic is counting on him this time, and his desire to not let Eggman get the final laugh, he's driven forward to find another Chaos Emerald in order to finish the tornado too. Simple adjustments to how Tails reacts to his own failures can help better shape his arc into something more defined. I love how the English voice track made Eggman sound much more menacing in Tails' story than in Sonic's, implying Tails perceives him as someone much scarier than Sonic does. This menacing performance from Eggman could help us relate to Tails, growing more scared than ever in the last act, as he sees Eggman planning to reduce Station Square into dust. In this moment, we should play up Tails' conflicting feelings of overwhelming fear of failure and his duty to protect the city just as Sonic would. Tails questions over and over, what if I don't make it in time? What if I fail? He wouldn't be capable of putting aside his fears but realizes that these doubts are useless. Sonic's not around, and the city will be faced with certain annihilation if he doesn't do something, knowing that no matter what he feels, he can't turn his back, and so chases after Eggman. After Speed Highway and preventing Eggman's act of destruction, this sends a system shock through Tails' mind, making him realize how pointless dragging his feet and laboring over his capabilities was. There was always going to be that point where he'd have to run with his own power, and that he never would have succeeded if he didn't try. This would give Tails the courage necessary Necessary to face Eggman one on one, or even though he's anxious to the point of shivering in fear, he's determined not to waver anymore. Regardless of the outcome, he's going to act. 
Once you get the Egg Walker's health down to a third, let's inject a good dose of awesome by having an epic, instrumental version of Tails' theme kick in, making the player feel that same sense of pride Tails must be feeling in this moment, then going into silence after the fight, as the crowd cheers him on. Tails' main theme then starting up as he realizes he's had the power inside him all along, playing on into the next scene, meeting back up with Sonic, and into his end credits capping off a story in a very cathartic and uplifting manner, both Tails and the player feeling like they've accomplished something great. Aside from Tails' arc, there are a few more details we can touch up for his story. For when Eggman tricks Sonic and Tails into gathering the emeralds for him, Tails should retrieve his jewel radar that was mentioned in the Sonic 3 manual, as the explanation for how they're able to track down the emeralds without using the special stages. Like mentioned before, we could have Emerald Hill as an extra unlockable stage as a reward for getting all emblems, so you could then use it as a set for Tails' flashback of meeting Sonic, since it's supposed to be a recreation of how it happened at the start of Sonic 2 anyway. Tails wandering on his own, discouraged from constant bullying, but upon seeing Sonic zoom by, he's exhilarated and begins following him, seeing him as a cool rule model. And after that, as the game takes place in the evening, Sand Hill should reflect that time of day, perhaps with a new music track being given to it, more befitting of nighttime. At the end of this Sand Hill, you could have him come across murals and stone artwork depicting the Seven Emeralds and the Master Emerald, leading into his flashback with Decal nicely. These flashback scenes are a fun aspect of SA1's storytelling, where all the characters get their own scenes of what went down in the past. Since the scenes are presented out of order, it becomes a game of piecing it all together to get the bigger picture of the character motivations and true stakes at play. But one criticism toward them is why Tikal would show certain seemingly uninvolved characters these flashbacks. Well, like with Tales' flashback here, we can rework the lead-ins to some of these scenes to feel more organic, where certain characters instead stumble upon this stuff by themselves by interacting with pieces of the lost civilization that give them visions of the ancient past. As Sonic and Tails land on the Egg Carrier, we now come to the only real plot hole of SA1. Tails used the Red Emerald to power the Tornado 2, but considering how they're trying to prevent Chaos and Eggman from obtaining all seven Red Emeralds, why after they land on the Egg Carrier do they just leave it there instead of taking it with them? Honestly, it's a miracle Chaos didn't just snatch it, considering it's literally just a couple dozen meters away at the time of the Chaos 6 boss fight. So, we'll instead have Tails make sure to take the Chaos Emerald with him, but then how does it end up in the jungle at Big's house in that case? Easy. When Tails and Amy escape from the ship, since it's storming by that point, you can have a clap of thunder and flash of lightning totally startle Tails, causing him to drop the Emerald where it plummets into the Mystic Ruins jungle below. Lastly, for Tails' story, the missile should be rewritten into a bomb. Because as threatening as Eggman intending to nuke a city is, it's pretty stupidly convenient for us that it just happened to be a dud and didn't explode. So instead, have Eggman call in his robots to fly in a giant ass bomb and transport it to the heart of the city, where Tails then must chase them and Eggman down before they have a chance to set it off. <laughs> Now on to Knuckles. Since his story and character for that matter is on the more solitary side, I think we should expand on Knuckles' introspection. In this case, him coming to grips with his lineage. At the start of the story, Knuckles sets the table through an inner monologue, telling about how he doesn't know the reason he protects the Master Emerald, that's just the only life he's ever known. Then throughout the story, his comfortable life is unraveled as Tikal shows him various flashbacks of his ancestry and what happened in the past. Knuckles should react to these each time, such that he is disturbed, conflicted, yet also intrigued. After being alone for so long and having long forgotten the purpose of his job, Knuckles should be confused as to how to react to all this suddenly being thrust upon him. For the first flashback, it should have a significantly bigger and more immediate impact on him, since he literally travels through the ancient Echidna city and interacts with the only other people of his race he's seen in forever. Knuckles should be struck with an overwhelming sense of home and familiarity that he doesn't know how to deal with. This opens his heart to learning more about his lineage in the coming flashbacks, and subsequently, makes it easier to tear right through him. For the second flashback, after he sees the ancient altar and he call pleading to Chaos and the Master Emerald to save themselves from the incoming Echidna invasion, Knuckles would feel a growing sense of dread that something awful is going to happen, knowing the state the altar is in in present day, and the fact that he's the only Echidna left. Then, everything can come to a head as of the final flashback, seeing how events unfolded into tragedy that resulted in the deaths of many of his people due to their own wrath. Coming out of this, Knuckles would be overwhelmed with a mix of conflicting emotions, anger, sadness, fear, but above all else, now dreading learning the truth of his duty as the Master Emerald's guardian. 
Couple this with Knuckles seeing a menacing silhouette of perfect chaos over the mountains during the flashback, and we can use this to build toward a poetic conclusion to his story. As Knuckles helps Sonic and Big defeat Chaos 6, Knuckles could let out a piece of dialogue along the lines of, Perish, evil heart. I have nothing to do with you. Him destroying Chaos could be used as symbolic for Knuckles discarding his investment in the past, and responsibility for whatever his people did. As he then returns home and restores the Master Emerald back to normal, he resigns himself to staying ignorant, so as to preserve his peaceful and solitary lifestyle, for fear of what might happen if he knows the truth, just like in the original game. Just some emphasizing of the character emotions and parts of the story, I think can really help make the character's arc be much more impactful. And for Knuckles in particular, it's a bittersweet end that he chooses for himself. That should leave you feeling happy, but also sorry for him. Aside from his arc, there are a couple more touch-ups we can make to Knuckles' story. People get hung up on Knuckles being tricked by Eggman for the second time since Sonic 3, but they're always forgetting that Knuckles doesn't actually take it to heart until he sees Sonic holding the green Chaos Emerald and mistakes it for a piece of the Master Emerald. All Eggman did was plant a seed of doubt. Nonetheless, we can tweak Eggman's dialogue tricking Knuckles from a lie he tells him directly to more of an offhand remark he makes as he leaves. Something like, listen to you blabber on while Sonic is snatching up the emerald as we speak. After that scene, we can then add a line of dialogue from Knuckles along the lines of, it's not like I can trust Eggman, but I better check up on Sonic, just in case. To make it explicitly clear, he doesn't just believe Eggman without question. Knuckles' flashback in Lost World could be preceded by him coming across a sequence of murals depicting the conquering, plundering nature of his ancient ancestry, which would then be a good lead-in to the scene of Tikal warding Chaos and the Master Emerald. When Knuckles sees Gamma, we should also be able to see that he's carrying Froggy with him like he should be. And at that, we should see him in the Mystic Ruins instead of on Angel Island, which prompts him to follow Gamma into the jungle, leading him to discovering Eggman's base. Coming into Amy's story, another character who's been greatly influenced by the heroic deeds of Sonic. We can do the same with her as with Tails and Knuckles, and adjust some scenes so that we have a more clearly defined character arc. At the start, after escaping from Zero, let's show Amy to be much more frightened by the incident. But when she notices that Birdie is shivering and even more scared, she puts aside her own fear to comfort them, putting Amy's care and consideration for others front and center, just as she'll show Gamma later, which in and of itself helps kickstart his entire character arc. And of course, it's not long before they run into Sonic, in which she immediately asks him to be Birdie's bodyguard as she's grown to come to him to solve everything. And by just being with him, Amy's drive for excitement is fired up once again. After narrowly escaping Zero and Hot Shelter, you can show her feeling comically overwhelmed that she's bitten off more than she can chew, doing what she can to get Birdie to safety, but she'd also be genuinely excited by the thrill of the adventure, contrasting with the beginning where she was bored of the mundanity of everyday life. So after escaping the egg carrier, she starts to regret causing so much trouble for Sonic and Tails, and feels frustrated that she needs to be saved so often by others. This kicks her into gear, deciding that she should take more initiative, leading nicely into the next part of her story, all about her going on her own adventure to help Birdie find their siblings. At the end of Amy's final egg, how about instead of hopping onto a balloon to clear the stage, we have her destroy an animal capsule, showing how far she's come by saving tiny animals from the clutches of Eggman, just as Sonic has done many times before, proving to herself that she could be strong on her own. When returning to the egg carrier, Zero would suddenly appear for the last time and injure Birdie. At this point, Zero should be totally beat up and falling apart after everything he's endured, now being in a permanent rage mode and out for blood. I'd love for Amy to be shown to go into a much more passionate rage. Just imagine how pumped you could get for the ensuing boss fight if Amy was shown to have her blood boiling at the sight of her friend getting hurt, making taking that tin can we've been running from this whole time head-on much more satisfying. So through all this to the end, where Amy successfully reunites Birdie with their siblings, Amy's arc can be refined such that she learns she doesn't have to wait for Sonic to help others, or make life exciting. She can do all those things herself, in her own way. As for other parts of Amy's story, let's tweak Amy's flashback to the days of Sonic CD at the very start, to where Amy is using her classic design, and the environments are that of Palm Tree Panic and Metallic Madness. Just like what we did with Emerald Hill for Tails' flashback. That nice, extra bit of continuity between the classics and adventure. Between Sonic and Amy's stories, there was a discrepancy where they'd be separated in Twinkle Park at sunset, in which Sonic would find her being kidnapped the next day. However, in Amy's version, that happens at sunset of the same day, yet the next scene takes place during broad daylight anyway? 
We could address this with an idea I brought up earlier. I wanted to give Amy two more levels and one of them would be Windy Valley. So Zero would capture Amy like an OG, bringing her to the Mystic Ruins. This could be an opportunity to give Birdie their own moment and escape Zero's grasp, then distracting him and causing him to drop Amy, in which both of them then escape into Windy Valley in a nighttime version of the level at that. Let's have a scene after the level where Dawn has started to break like Speed Highway. Amy and Birdie have evaded Eggman's forces and seem to be safe. Things start to cool down and grow lighthearted between them, only for Zero to appear in a big jump scare recapturing them, showing how much of a looming force he is to be reckoned with from Amy's perspective. Meanwhile, Sonic can have a cutscene after his speed highway of the newsstand talking about how Amy has been kidnapped and taken to the Mystic Ruins, so that's how he knows to go there. After which, the story resumes as normal, as Sonic is too late before Zero whisks Amy and Birdie into the egg carrier. But what about Amy's second new level, Sand Hill? Well, it could be placed just before her last level, Final Egg, since it's on the way there. While wandering through the jungle in search of Eggman's base, they could spot Zero on the hunt for them. T-Call can then appear and lead them into the desert in order to avoid him. This would also be a great place to move Amy's flashback scene. At the end of the level, you could have a cutscene of Amy being shown a mural conveying chaos as the guardian of the Chow. This would then lead into her flashback of T'Kal discovering the Chow around the altar and meeting chaos. After this flashback, Amy could be motivated to talk to Birdie about the Chow, and give us some more insight on how they live in the modern age. Amy could tell Birdie all about how there's a Chow garden in Station Square she loves to visit every now and then, finding them so adorable. Telling about how they're mysterious little creatures that no one knows the origin of, but since they can't survive on their own, people around the world have taken them in to care for them, bringing those who visit them joy and comfort. Did someone mention cats and frogs? No? Well, what can you do? Big Story had a very tangential reference to the overall plot of SA1, but unlike his gameplay, I think that's okay. I think Big serves as a nice, goofy piece of comic relief to complement the other stories. So, I think Big Story should focus less on building a character arc, but more so simply putting a smile on your face through the fun antics of a big purple cat with an even bigger heart. Especially now that we would have access to detailed models and animations that would allow for so much more potential in expressing the character in his wacky journey. Like I said, the end of every one of Big's levels should have a comic and increasingly absurd animation of Froggy slipping out of Big's grasp. Another scene which we could make more comedic is the scene of Big encountering Tails in possession of Froggy. For Big's version of this scene, I feel it has to go full on over the top. Big should make a shocked expression and run at them in slow motion, Tails looking utterly terrified, with Big then tripping over a tiny little pebble, flying through the air in a super dramatic fashion, only to plummet face first into the dirt, sliding over in front of Tails, in which things go silent. And after a short beat, Froggy wiggles out of Tails' grasp, bounces over Big, and hops away, Big then groaning into the dirt. Remember how I mentioned both Big and Gamma could be given another level in Lost World? Well, after Gamma snatches Froggy from Big and Emerald Coast, Big would chase them all the way to the Mystic Ruins jungle, in which you could have a funny scene of Big and Gamma bantering, which I imagine would be pure nonsense fuel. In Big's version of this scene, I imagine him launching into this comically absurd flashback, where he talks about how he was just a defenseless little kitten in the jungle with an empty tummy. That's when he made the greatest fisherman the world has ever known. Frog teaching him the art of the rod and nurturing him into the big, strong feline he is today. How they live their lives full of joy in their hearts and tasty salmon in their bellies. Katsugama sparks and smoke flying out of his head trying to comprehend this. Full credit to Loopersum for creating these amazingly cute role reversal designs for Big and Froggy, by the way. Gamma unrelenting, however, this would inevitably lead to the character battle of Big vs. Gamma, after which Big would narrowly grab Froggy only for him to escape into the ancient ruins nearby, leading both of them into Lost World and Chase. And after Big's version of the level, this would be a good place to move his decal flashback. It could be provoked by Big finding an ancient depiction of not only the Master Emerald along with the Seven Emeralds, but the people who live by them. In the original game, the altar was a lonesome relic, but let's expand things here to where the altar is now part of a broader tribe that built many of the settings we saw in Sonic 3, where we can convey how this civilization built themselves around the Chao, Chaos, and the Emeralds and revere them, constructing new temples and shrines like Hidden Palace. This should carry over into the flashbacks themselves as well, where the architecture here harkens back to the settings we see in Sonic 3, it being the same place and all. That'd make the Echidna's violent aggression make more sense as an actual invasion of a conquering yet another tribe, and not just stealing the emeralds. At the climax of Big's campaign, what if we changed how Big reacts to the whole event? 
As Big learns the truth about what's been happening to Froggy, that he's been possessed by Chaos and used as a tool to collect emeralds, as he sees Froggy struggling inside Chaos's body, begging for help, Big lowers his head, shoulders shaking, saying he doesn't like getting mad, because it doesn't feel good to him or anyone else. But he takes off his gloves and looks back up, baring his claws, growling that he won't let him hurt his pal anymore, showing us a hidden dimension to this character and leaving a mark that there's a bit more to him than just a happy-go-lucky dopey cat. Later, when Froggy is returned to normal and he and Big escape the egg carrier, think of how funny the scene of him attempting to fly Tails' plane could be with brand new models and animations. Big says something like, well, how hard can it be? Then to immediately cut to him and Froggy screaming in the sky while spiraling out of control through the storm and back home. The Tornado 2 is still functioning without the Chaos Emerald, just not well. Similarly, Big's ending montage has a lot of goofy and heartwarming potential, especially the scene of him and Froggy dancing atop the ruins. If you were paying attention, you'll remember I said Tails would drop the Red Emerald over the Mystic Ruins jungle while escaping the Egg Carrier. Well, this is where we'd pick that plot thread up, with Big fishing the Red Emerald out of the water, allowing it to still end up in the same place as OG, and giving him a new lucky charm for the time being. Gamma's story was definitely the most heartfelt and tragic of the bunch, focusing on an Eggman robot developing a sense of self-awareness thanks to Amy and the Birdie, where he travels to free the animals trapped within his robot brethren, rationalizing it to himself as saving them. It's a sweet story of a robot who grows a big heart, and I think there are some things we can do to expand on it. Gamma is a mech who is confronted with a lot early on, piling up emotions that conflict with his programming to follow his master's every order. The scene of him sorting through all that in a desperate attempt to make a decision was already great in OG, and will be made even better thanks to modern presentation value for all those key moments. The strange feelings he felt for Birdie, the kindness Amy showed toward him, the twisted dismantling of Beta, and the banishment of his E-Series brethren. In one of the original game's cutscenes, each E-Series robot actually spoke one line each. This should be expanded upon, giving significantly more dialogue to Delta, Epsilon, and Zeta. With perhaps Zeta having an actual female voice, and not just a man doing a high-pitched voice. <laughs> then we can give them all their own colorful personalities, with cutscenes before everyone's boss fight. Beta, however, I feel is the only E-Series robot other than Zero that should remain completely silent, as Beta doesn't need a voice. He already clearly conveys his personality in SA1 through his actions, and how he takes being the best E-Series robot very seriously, and will do whatever it takes to claim that title. But Delta could have a hot-blooded and youthful voice, and he'd be plagued with an inferiority complex, especially after being banished by Eggman. He could be angry at his mistreatment, and has convinced himself that if he can defeat Eggman's star pupil, he'll prove he's the strongest E-Series in the end. Epsilon could have a deep voice and be an insane megalomaniac, maniacally laughing having already convinced himself that he is the best robot, and intent on taking his revenge on his creator. Zeta, on the other hand, could come up as calm and collected. Since she's already returned to the egg carrier and made it her home essentially, while also building herself into a giant machine, she could be at ease, but still very territorial. When Gamma descends into the wreckage of the egg carrier in search of Zeta, throughout the level Zeta could speak to Gamma over the ship's intercom, saying that she has nothing to say to him and warns him to stay away. Once Gamma reaches where she's holed up, they could converse first about what Gamma intends to do. Zeta could let him know that she was compelled to come back out of a desire to beg Eggman for another chance, but has since made the place her home, and is happy the way she is. And so, even if it were to free the animal within her, she could tell Gamma that it matters not whether or not she is truly alive. She thinks, therefore she is. She could then ask Gamma if he's going to deny that he too is capable of feeling. I feel adding this conversation with Zeta makes Gamma's whole life and mission all the more ambiguous and tragic. It's not just the animals inside of them that are suffering, but the robots being powered by them that have developed their own sense of identity. Gamma wouldn't be capable of answering to Zeta, and would only respond by fighting on. After the boss fight, Zeta would express fear and panic in her final moments, prompting Gamma to realize what he's been doing isn't so black and white. Before Zeta shuts down for good, Gamma apologizes sadly and kneels down. But the animal within Zeta emerges and perches itself onto Gamma's gun, looking up at him happily. To continue this emotional wait, I don't think there should be any music for the adventure field between exiting Hot Shelter and going back outside. I feel Zeta's plight also enhances the impact of the scene afterwards, where Gamma realizes he would have to kill himself in order to free the animal trapped in him, just as he's done to the rest of his E-Series brethren. 
In the middle of this introspection, let's change things a bit to where Beta appears like before, but slowly descends from above, right in front of Gamma, where they both exchange wordless stares. Beta then turns and zooms off toward the boss arena, for you to follow him. When you catch up, Beta could slowly approach Gamma, raise a claw, and plant it gently into Gamma's shoulder as a symbol of camaraderie of some sort, where after a moment, Gamma returns the gesture, showing how, in the end, they're still brothers, but they both know what needs to be done. A fight to the death to once and for all prove who is the strongest E-Series robot, and to free each other's animals. Aside from all that, there are a couple other things here I want to address. Earlier I said we should have Knuckles encounter Gamma in the Mystic Ruins, and that's where he would be prompted to follow him to Eggman's base. Like an OG. But in this remake, Gamma would be intercepted by Big before reaching the base, after which they'd both be wrapped up in Lost World. So let's tweak things to where Knuckles loses track of Gamma once reaching the jungle, but is able to find Eggman's base on his own. I mean, it's kinda hard to miss after all. Meaning now Knuckles arrives to it and sneaks aboard the Egg Carrier before Gamma arrives there. Just a small change necessitated by other additions, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Just like the other characters, Gamma's flashback from Tikal would be recontextualized to be provoked by him coming across artwork within Lost World. He could finally find Froggy, who is possessed by chaos may I remind you, gazing upon a set of ancient pottery, all with artwork on them depicting how chaos came to be. Perhaps being a chow that mutated into the watery being we know. This is something that never made it into the final game, so it'd be really cool to see that subtly worked in. And this would fit with what Tikal then shows, and explains to Gamma, about how Chaos has assumed the role of Guardian of the Chow. And as we come to a close on the campaigns of the six playable characters, let's go over one last thing regarding the puzzle that is the story of the ancient past. Let's have a room aboard the Egg Carrier that features the stone tablets Eggman mentioned at the start of the game, for how he discovered the Legend of Chaos. One depicting how with the Seven Emeralds, Chaos is able to transform into the Fearful Serpent, and another depicting how Chaos was sealed away within the Master Emerald and the landmass was torn from the Earth and risen up into the heavens to keep him isolated forever. Unlike all of the other murals conveying pieces of this backstory, these two tablets would be relegated for the player to discover on their own, as they snoop around in Eggman's private quarters. That's a great place to segue into the final story unlocked after completing all of the main six, where that puzzle finally comes into play. I think the scene of Angel Island falling for the second time should be unique and not simply recycled from the first time. Then when Eggman crashes nearby, the scene of Chaos sneaking up on Knuckles should be made more foreboding and dramatic, by the camera following Chaos and zooming into Knuckles' eye as the screen cuts black, and he screams. In the scene afterwards, Sonic should be relaxing somewhere far away where Angel Island isn't in view. Because it's really fucking dumb how Tails comes up to him and is like, Sonic, Angel Island's fallen again, and Sonic is just like, what? I didn't know that, and it's like right fucking behind him. Sonic and Tails arrived at the scene and learned that Chaos used the sneak attack to opportunistically snatch the six emeralds Knuckles has brought back with him. In which Tikal then appears for the final flashback scene, involving Tails and Knuckles in it along with Sonic this time around, where they all have a chance to react to everything that unfolded on that fateful night in the ancient past. During this, Tails can say Tikal's name, so that's how Sonic knows it later. This scene shouldn't pull any punches either. It shouldn't be afraid of showing the violence the Echidna has inflicted upon the Chow and the surrounding tribe. Like in Knuckles' story, we should be able to see a dark silhouette of chaos over the horizon going on a rampage with a threatening roar heard across the mountains as it begins to storm and rain. So we know exactly what Tikal is trying to stop when she goes to the Master Emerald and begs it to seal chaos away. After the flashback, things should be presented as if no time has passed at all. Just so it doesn't come off like Tikal is outright interrupting the heroes when they should be frantically searching for the last emerald. All three of them should immediately then leave and search for the last emerald together. 
Using the same jewel radar, Tails leads the three of them into the jungle, to Big's house, where they then find him and Froggy hanging out without a care in the world. The characters attempt to explain the situation to them and that they need that last Chaos Emerald he's got. Considering Big has seen what happens when Chaos is given an Emerald, and has been shown by Decal that the Chaos Emeralds aren't any ordinary gems, he should be quick and willing to give up his new lucky charm to them. But just when he's about to hand the Emerald over, Chaos whisks it away, leaving everybody shocked. We can then show Tails scared as to what's going to happen next. Knuckles says history is repeating itself, and Chaos' fury is going to be unleashed. To which Sonic realizes Station Square is in danger and zooms off. This would also be the reason Big ends up tagging along with them. Imagine how devastatingly amazing a scene of Station Square being utterly totaled would look in modern day CGI. Just like in OG, I think the scene should play without any music, as the screams of the citizens, sounds of rushing water and glass breaking are more than enough to sell the scene. I feel the lack of music here really allows us to reflect on the fact that, yes, we failed to prevent this disaster we knew was coming all along. After that scene, you could show a group of civilians attempting to save someone from being swept away in the rising water. Sonic arrives just in time to get to them to safety, in which you could then resume to the proper cutscene as in the original. This is just to convey how the citizens of Station Square are struggling. In the original, Eggman showed up in a second day carrier in an attempt to stop Chaos and put him down for good, only for it to immediately be destroyed. The sudden appearance of this second ship felt like kind of an ass pull for a shallow joke of Eggman being easily brushed aside by perfect Chaos. I feel we should rework this scene for the sake of feeling more natural and preserving the tone of the climax. Let's have Eggman instead show up in a unique fighter mech he specifically created to kill Chaos if he ever went out of control, like now. Shooting frigid beams that immediately freeze Chaos in place, utterly immobilizing him, giving players and the characters a sense of hope as Eggman begins charging up the fighter's main cannon to finish Chaos off. But before he can, Chaos shakes free of the icy stasis, firing a beam straight at him, Eggman just narrowly ejecting himself in time as his ship is struck and reduced to flames and smoke. This would cause Sonic to leap into action and attempt to fight Chaos himself, only for his efforts to be in vain as his attacks have no effect and is nearly killed in the process. If you want to make this even more impactful, you could turn this into a gameplay section, again giving you a false sense of hope, where you platform over a bunch of debris and try to take Chaos head on only to be smacked away and hit repeatedly. The gameplay segment would end when Chaos hits you when you have no rings. You can then cut to the rest of the characters having arrived and gathered together, watching it all unfold before them. Amy should be utterly distraught, Station Square literally being her home after all. Tails would be in his darkest moment, mind in a panic and at a loss for what to do. But Knuckles will not relent. Even if he's declared he has nothing to do with what his ancestors did, deep down he still feels a sense of responsibility to stop chaos. So he won't give up. Knuckles angrily asks Tails what they should do, mentioning that they could use the Chaos Emeralds. But Tails says the Chaos Emeralds' power has been absorbed by chaos, and that they're useless now. Big could then apologize, talking about how if he wasn't so blind to everything going on around him, he could have prevented all this suffering. But Knuckles interjects, sullenly stating that this has nothing to do with him. As Chaos lets out a roar, Big wonders what in the world would make someone so angry that they'd want to destroy the world. But Amy chimes in, saying to her, Chaos' roar sounds more sad, like a cry of pain. This then triggers Tails into realizing something. He calls back to what t -Call told him earlier in the story, that the Chaos Emeralds draw power from the user's heart. So if Chaos is nothing but a mass of anger and sadness, they may still have a chance to use the Emeralds for themselves. In telling everybody else this, they become determined to search for the Chaos Emeralds that were flung away, as it's their last chance. And so you jump into their short seven levels, in search of the Emeralds. At the end of each segment, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Big could all have lines of dialogue befitting of their growth from their character arcs. Like Tails saying his power alone isn't enough. But that's fine, because this time they have to believe in each other for this plan to work. Knuckles would question if all of this is happening because he failed in his true duty, but he tells himself screw notions of the past and responsibility. What's happening now is unacceptable and he won't let it go on. Amy could list the names of the people she knows and loves here, and talk about how scared she is, but knowing how scared her loved ones must be as well, she resolves to do anything she can to help. And lastly, Big could comment that seeing people get hurt like this makes him sad, that people can do terrible things and innocent folks suffer for it all the time, and that it can be easy to forget that. 
These could be some rare words of wisdom from Big that also happens to encapsulate the message of SA1's story. After that set of stages, like an OG ET call reveals her true form to Sonic, and is proposing imprisoning Chaos back in the Master Emerald again. But Sonic, now understanding Chaos's plight and able to empathize with them on some level, stubbornly resolves to find a solution that will ensure this will never happen again, and one that doesn't trap Chaos in endless inner torment. But here, Tikal shoots back that they have no other choice, saying she's already lost her home and loved ones, and can't bear to see these people suffer through the exact same thing. Sonic wouldn't have anything to respond with, merely gritting his teeth in frustration, emphasizing how useless he is to resolve this crisis with his own abilities and willpower. In this moment of weakness, it's all the other characters who show up to support him. Chaos Emeralds in tow. As the other characters show up and the hype ramps up, we can see shots of the citizens atop Station Square's rooftops cheering Sonic on to save the day. With Big and Amy's help in realizing what can be done, Tails tells Sonic that the power of the Emeralds is drawn from the user's heart, Chaos being energized through anger and sadness. But they care for Sonic, he cares for them, and the people here care for one another. That kind of heart is more than enough to revive the Emeralds and create tremendous power. This scene perfectly brings Sonic's character full circle, Sonic being a beacon of hope who inspires growth and strength in those around him. And so in those moments where he's unable to go at it alone, it's those he's inspired that show up to support him. Powered by the hopes of everyone involved here, he's able to transform into Super Sonic, and properly match Perfect Chaos's power in a true clash of emotional willpower. Open Your Heart, starting from this cutscene, should carry over seamlessly into the boss fight. In this boss, we could use the cut beta dialogue between Tikal and Super Sonic, and have a line from each character throughout each part of the boss fight cheering him on. Once Chaos is defeated, Sonic's end quote could be something more fitting, like, That's enough now. You've been set free. Sonic left his heart open to Chaos when nobody else was willing to, not even to call, and as a result, was able to find a better solution that makes the world a safer place. In the following cutscene, Chaos can be shown as a pathetic little puddle of water, barely able to stand. Sonic returns to his friends, the fight having drained him, letting out a simple, thank you guys, for all their help. The Chow of Station Square then emerge to approach Chaos, recognizing him as their longtime protective, loving guardian. And seeing the Chow for the first time in thousands of years, safe and sound and comforting him, he's able to rise and embrace him in a quiet, sweet moment. Sakal too approaches Chaos, comforting him in the wake of his inner torment being neutralized, and in its place is now the love he felt for those he once protected. As Chaos murmurs a cry, overwhelmed by these warm emotions he hasn't felt in so long, Sakal merely telling him over and over that that everything is okay now. Perhaps these Chow could all take on the appearance of the actual Chow you'd have in your gardens by this point, making it all feel more personal. Knuckles too should crack a smile, relieved to be free from the burden of the past, just as Chaos is free of his inner torment. But suddenly, Tikal approaches him, saying she knows he doesn't really know her, but she's watched him from within the Master Emerald his whole life, watched him grow into an honorable guardian, and, well, she just wanted to thank him for his devotion, and everyone else's who came before him, for doing what they could to mend the wounds of the past. Knuckles, in emotional paralysis, can only respond with a tightening grip on her hand, fighting back his emotions from the sensation of being able to touch another of his own kind after so long with being all alone. Tikal then returns to Chaos, extending a hand out to him as they rise into the heavens to finally be at peace, their spirits finally free. The characters are relieved that the battle is over, but know that recovering from all this is going to be tough. That's when they notice Sonic has already left, departing into the vast cityscape, leaving them all befuddled. Why does Sonic depart so abruptly, when there's still so much damage to be repaired? Well, I think that's up to the players to interpret, and what it means for his character. Amy turns back to the other characters, deciding that regardless, they'll do what they can to help out the people hurt by all this. Knowing they can take care of themselves, Big and Tails cheerfully agree with her. With one last glimpse of Sonic looking upon Station Square, as the sunlight beams through the storm clouds, the credits are summoned in the closing of this story. And that is my Dream Sonic Adventure Remake.
One that improves, adds to, and preserves the original game. Taking the gameplay, mechanics, levels, hubs, story, world, and characters, and fleshing them out to build the ideal version of the game that gets it to its maximum potential. Taking that sweet childhood gem and thrusting it into the modern age for current fans to enjoy, and for future fans to discover. So, what better way to rediscover that magic than by recreating the first main 3D Sonic game, Sonic Adventure? But, at the end of the day, I'm just one guy who don't know shit about programming or much about developing a game. What I do know, though, is that I love Sonic Adventure, and hope to someday see it recreated in a full, faithful remake so that its legacy can be better carried on into the future. And for that alone, this video has been a blessing to make. If you have any ideas of your own for an SA1 remake, post them down in the comments. But what's next? I'll tell you what, the Ruby Rebalanced Halo Campaign Overhaul series is something I've found lots of enjoyment in, modding games that I know and love so well and have played for years. I already have lots of videos about them if you're interested, but sadly updates have rendered them unplayable. However, with the advent of modding tools for the Master Chief Collection, the time has come to revive my mods and make them better than ever before, starting with Halo Combat Evolved. So that's our next big goal, it's time to return to Halo modding. The best way to support me in the meantime is simply chipping in a couple bucks on my Patreon, if you'd be so kind, and also checking out my Blood, Sweat, and Tears anime series, Pokemon Manifest Heart? Like please, I've literally been working on it for 10 years! <laughs> But thank you so much again for sticking with me through this endless gush of ideas. Sonic Adventure is an important game to me, so I'm just giving back to it. And well, I guess I'll see you in the next Gush Fest. Peace.